I call to order the high-level thematic debate on digital cooperation and connectivity. This meeting is held in accordance with Resolution 72-313 of 17th of December 2018, in which the General Assembly recognized the value of holding interactive, inclusive thematic debates on current issues of critical importance to the international community and called upon the President of the General Assembly to organize such debates in close consultation with the General Committee and Member States. Therefore, I decided to convene this thematic debate in light of the importance of digital divide in the context of COVID-19 pandemic and the Sustainable Development Goals and in response to numerous requests from member, member countries. I warmly welcome all of you to this meeting. I'll make my opening statement from the rostrum. Your Majesties, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Thank you for joining the high-level thematic debate on digital cooperation and connectivity. Today's discussion reflects both the unparalleled pace of global digitization and the widening digital divide, which has been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Our gathering is a direct response to member states' requests that this issue be addressed at the highest levels of the UN. By taking the initiative to convene today's debate, I aim to ensure that this topic is prioritized. It is my hope that by building political momentum on digital issues, we can accelerate progress and move rapidly to empower people everywhere. The fact of the matter is that some 3.7 billion people remain digitally disconnected with no options to work learn, trade, or connect online. In a world of unparalleled innovation, where our loved ones are, but a video call away, billions struggle to access even the most basic elements of connectivity, or live with none of, not at all. Truly, for billions of people, the pace and scale of sustainable development is reliant upon digital connectivity. Dear colleagues, the digital divide threatens to become the new face of inequality. If it is those already furthest behind in developed and developing countries alike and across rural, urban, language and gender divides who remain disconnected. The starkness of the divide is bordering on immoral. This brings new urgency to securing digital connectivity for all, particularly for those in least developed countries, landlocked developing countries and small island developing states who remain the least connected. And now is the time to act. Recovery from COVID-19 is an inflection point, one that offers us a chance to undertake truly transformational changes. As I have frequently stated, we must use the SDGs as a guide to our post-COVID recovery. This means ensuring that no one is left behind, no one is left offline, and that we apply a whole of society, multi-stakeholder and intergenerational approach to our efforts. This is particularly important for the world's 1.8 billion young people who must be equipped with the skills and resources to thrive in an ever-changing, tech-driven future. The United Nations and the General Assembly in particular must be a leader in this regard, including by bringing together all stakeholders. Past General Assembly action has led to implementation mechanisms and entities such as the Technology Facilitation Mechanism and the UN Technology Bank for Least Developing Countries. We can do so much more, inspired by today's spotlight 
on best practices and transformative coalitions and ideas. I urge you to consider what decisions the General Assembly can and must take. Together, we can strengthen implementation of global, regional, and multilateral initiatives, including the Secretary General's Roadmap for Digital Cooperation. We can work together to close both the energy and digital divide simultaneously, connecting the almost 800 million people who lack electricity. This is especially important ahead of the high-level dialogue on energy this September. We can strengthen global digital governance, financing, and investments to help expand access while managing breaches which range from data and privacy policies to online crime and harassment to misinformation and disinformation. And we can help build synergies across both the UN system and the SDGs, highlighting how digitization can support the entire 2030 agenda, including efforts to address desertification, biodiversity, climate, and pollution. On this, I would point to the Coalition on Digital Environmental Sustainability, CODES, launched in support of the Secretary General's roadmap as a strong example of where the environment and digital connectivity worlds meet. Dear colleagues, the digital divide was real long before COVID-19. The global pandemic has only exacerbated and underscored this problem, starkly highlighting the digital haves and the digital have-nots. This is an issue that may only grow in importance the longer the pandemic persists. We cannot afford to wait. By galvanizing political momentum today, we can focus our energies towards existing initiatives and processes, as well as plant the seeds for new initiatives and partnerships for action. As the, more, as the world's most inclusive multilateral forum, the United Nations General Assembly has an obligation to reflect the needs of people everywhere with a widening digital divide that threatens to undermine progress across the entirety of the sustainable development agenda, we have an obligation to leave no one behind and to strengthen the tools and mechanisms needed to empower people everywhere. I look forward to your ideas on how we can make this a reality. Thank you very much. I now invite His Excellency Minur Akram, Permanent Representative of Pakistan to the United Nations and President of the Economic and Social Council to make a statement. colleagues and friends. I would like to extend my gratitude to the President of the General Assembly for convening today's meeting and inviting me to speak on this occasion. Mr. President, the COVID-19 pandemic has revealed the world's dependence on digitalization uh, the world would literally not be able to function without the internet. Business, commerce, production, 
health systems, education, all are now relevant and dependent on remote connectivity. The United Nations itself would not have been able to continue its work last year without digital tools. The ECOSOX work this year has been conducted very largely in virtual meetings. Of course, after 40 or 50 Zoom calls a week, many of us can develop aggressive tendencies towards our computers. We long to get back to the interpersonal interaction, which is the essence of our profession. Yet, we cannot deny that the future of our societies and of our nations will be increasingly digital. International cooperation will be essential to optimize the opportunities offered by digitalization and the associated frontier technologies. Among these opportunities are higher productivity in all sectors, agriculture, manufacturing, services, finance, trade, and communications, job creation. The fastest growth in employment is now in work related to the ICT sector and expanding digitalization. Access to knowledge and information, enabling our people in the remotest corners of the world to be included and to benefit from a globalized international society. And importantly, in creating a green global economy. A central issue, of course, is the digital divide, as mentioned by the President of the Assembly. 87% of people are online in the advanced countries, only 19% in the poorest countries. Women are doubly disadvantaged, especially in the developing countries. While we conduct our business utilizing the digital space, the large part of the developing world lives isolated, cut off, and sometimes literally in darkness. The Secretary General has proposed a roadmap to bridge the digital divide. We need to elaborate the specific actions to implement this roadmap. Bridging the digital divide will require investment in both hardware and software. It is not sufficient to provide poor people with a mobile phone and satellite connections. They cannot access the tools required for education, for commerce, for production with these software. We need to invest in the infrastructure, infrastructure for broadband, the internet cables and the last mile solutions that are required to connect the world. This will need public and private investment in digital infrastructure. Investment in software encompasses developing the skills and education to utilize the existing and fast emerging technologies and techniques of the digital world the ability to access the computers and other devices at affordable prices. Indeed, with appropriate national support and international cooperation, developing countries can aim not so much to emulate the existing development models in the advanced economies, but to leapfrog with the help of a digitalized knowledge and skills into the economies of the future. This has been done by some developing countries and can be done by all developing countries. The key to their success is the political will of their governments 
to invest in the essential hardware and software and to foster participation in the emerging frontier technologies, G5, robotics, artificial in intelligence, and the cables and broadband required for connection. There are, as we all know, the dark sides of the web. A world which lives on the spread of disinformation and misinformation for narrow national and partisan objectives. A world where the net is used to propagate terrorism. A world where it is used to purvey pornography, to defame people <coughs> and states, to target minorities and vulnerable groups, to intrude into personal privacy, to conduct cyber warfare against sovereign nations, and to meet and to instigate conflicts and rivalries. We must develop <clears throat> the digital tools to identify such malicious activities and to defend against them and to neutralize them. It is self-evident that these objectives to optimize the opportunities offered by digitalization and to defend against its misuse cannot be achieved without inclusive international cooperation among all stakeholders. The role of the private sector is critical 70% of the ICT infrastructure is owned by private companies. And this ownership is highly concentrated in a handful of companies located in two countries. These companies collect most of the data generated by internet use. Data, as has been said, is the new gold and is enabling decisions on marketing, production, services, trade, and much else. The policies of these companies on tax, on profit shifting and transfer pricing, on free and fair competition, and on the propagation of hate and violence and terrorism, on privacy and security, on the responsible management of data are all issues for consideration in our efforts to promote safe and productive digitalization. To avoid bottlenecks in the application of frontier technologies, governments and the international community must also keep track of the mega trends in the digital space the explosive growth of data volumes, the fast pace and unpredictable changes in digital technologies, the ever stronger force of which the digitalization is driving on the course of our economic, social, and cultural changes, the dominance of the ICT data management companies. Excellencies, the international community is at an incipient stage in addressing the issue of digitalization. This debate will hopefully identify the major issues that need to be addressed. It could also attempt to identify how and where these issues will be addressed and a coherent system constructed for effective digital governance. The United Nations and its functional agencies and bodies possess the legitimacy and the convening power to promote and serve as the venue for international cooperation and governance of the digital space. For example, the Economic and Social Council Commission on Science and Technology and the forthcoming Forum on Science, Technology, and Innovation offer indispensable venues for inclusive consideration of digital cooperation and governance. Mr. President, I would 
end finally by expressing the hope that while seeking to bridge the North-South digital divide, we will be cautious not to trigger an equally debilitating East-West digital divide. The competition to harness technology in our world today should not become the face of tomorrow's trade wars. It will divide the world and erode the promise for accelerated global growth and transformation and the realization of a world which is sustainable, green, and equal. I thank you, Mr. President. I thank the President of the Economic and Social Council for his statement. I now invite the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, Her Excellency Amina Mohammed, to make a statement. Mr. President of the General Assembly, Mr. President of the Economic and Social Council, Excellencies, Distinguished Delegates, Colleagues, it really is a pleasure to join you here for this important discussion on digital cooperation. And I wish to thank the President of the General Assembly for convening this timely event. Our digital age holds much promise for turbocharging our work to achieve the SDGs, digital technologies, from artificial intelligence to blockchain, have truly the transformative potential. They augment human capacity, open new frontiers for productivity, and provide new opportunities for people and for our societies. But even as we recognize their vast potential, we must contend with the risks. We have seen digital technologies become vehicles for the spread of misinformation, hate speech, online child abuse, and violent extremism. In the wrong hands, they are tools for violating human rights and engaging in terrorist activity. Digital technologies can reinforce and indeed accelerate inequalities. As the world becomes more digitally dependent, it threatens to exclude those that remain disconnected. Almost half the world's population, 3.7 billion people, the majority of them women, and most in developing countries are still offline. The COVID-19 crisis has highlighted this disparity. While confronting the pandemic, those without internet access have been unable to benefit from remote education, remote work, or remote health services. Without decisive action, the digital divide will become the new face of inequality. I'd like to stress three key opportunities. First, in responding to the growing fragmentation in the digital space, the United Nations has a key role to play Geopolitical fault lines between major powers are emerging with technology as a leading area of tension and disagreement. Technology companies are responding in different ways to varying national approaches on issues such as privacy, data governance, and freedom from expression. This is made worse by the deepening digital divide between developed and developing countries, which means that global discussions on digital issues are often less inclusive and representative of the concerns and priorities of the Global South. Now more than ever, we need a global town hall to address these issues and to capitalize on technology's transformational potential to create new jobs, boost financial inclusion, close the gender gap, spur a green recovery, and redesign our cities. Second, no single country or company by itself should steer the course of our digital future. This is why we must reaffirm the value of engaging with all stakeholders and convening multi-stakeholder partnerships. The task of achieving universal connectivity cannot be left solely to governments or even to individual te technology companies. The same is true for managing artificial intelligence. Third, when faced with complex issues like online incitement to violence or the use of private data, the private sector is increasingly looking for guidance at the global level. 
minimum criteria or basic norms of behavior that can help level the playing field for all stakeholders, and in doing so, provide equal protection to all users and consumers, no matter where they are. Collectively, our task to help design digital environments that can connect everyone with a positive future is the way forward. This is why we need a common effort with collaboration among national and local governments, the private sector, civil society, academia, and multilateral organizations. As with other technologies of the past, we can work to create guardrails that ensure the digital transformation is a force for good. It is encouraging that member states have asked to improve digital cooperation and to use the United Nations as a platform for dialogue. As highlighted by President Bosquet, it will be crucial to build inclusive and open partnerships that can resist forces that are pulling us apart. Most importantly, in all our discussions and efforts, we must not lose sight of the people that we serve. We must prioritize concrete actions and outcome-oriented initiatives, such as the GIGA project, the UN's effort to connect every school in the world to the internet, and our ongoing efforts to ensure legal identity for all through digital birth registration. Collective action is the basis of the Secretary General's roadmap for digital cooperation. Good progress has been made in its implementation, but of course far more is needed. The establishment of the Office of the Technical Envoy has been an important step forward. Yet to reinvigorate our efforts to implement this vision during the decade of action, it will be crucial that we also include young people and businesses at the country level at the center of these discussions. We have much to learn from both the generation that will be most affected by the rapid changes currently taking place and the private sector, which is already having to adapt to survive. Their perspectives will be vital in ensuring our collective success. We look forward to continuing our shared efforts to build a more open, free and secure digital future that will accelerate the pace and put us back on track for the decade of action to the SDGs. I thank you. I thank the Deputy Secretary General for her statement and for taking the time to be with us this morning. I now invite the Assembly to view the pre-recorded statement of Her Majesty Queen Maxima of the Netherlands and the United Nations Secretary General's Special Advocate for Inclusive Finance for Development. President Boskier, Deputy Secretary General Ms. Mohammed, Ambassadors, ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to join you for this important debate on digital cooperation and connectivity. COVID-19 has caused the deepest global recession in eight decades. Over 150 million people around the world could be pushed into extreme poverty by the end of this year. This is especially challenging for marginalized groups who have limited or no access to the digital economy prior to this pandemic. Those in the informal sector have suffered significantly. These workers and businesses are typically not covered by social insurance nor registered for relevant government assistance programs. And women everywhere have also been disproportionately affected by the crisis. This underscores the importance that underserved segments have access to the tools they need to build resilience. Throughout the pandemic, we have witnessed the power of digital financial services. They have been critical to support crisis response and to help people explore new opportunities. More than 200 nations expanded social protection measures since the start of COVID-19, many using digital payment providers to make transfers directly into bank accounts or mobile wallets. We have also seen a shift to online payments for goods and services and increased access to the digital economy. These changes have demonstrated the importance of putting in place the needed digital public goods that create a resilient, equitable and trusted financial system. It is important to consider these key prerequisites as a set and not in silos. Some of these are critical for enabling access, such as connectivity and agent networks. Others make markets work better for customers, including fair competition and interoperable payment systems. 
and some protect the financial system and its users, such as data privacy, cybersecurity, consumer protection, and digital and financial literacy. Now is a great time to invest in this digital infrastructure, to pass reforms that allow countries and people to capitalize on digital technology, to address the digital divide, as well as ensure the underserved are not left behind. As governments and the private sector look to make progress, there are a number of actions we can take. First, focus on sequencing and coordination. This is vital as the urgency of the pandemic might result in decisions not always being aligned across players or with global best practices. Second, build upon international standards and best practices. These can help ensure that digital public goods are implemented responsibly with inclusion, privacy, and people's needs front and center. One cross-cutting element to be considered is ensuring digital public goods are designed and implemented in a gender intentional manner. For example, notable gender gaps in access to mobile phones and internet connection need to be taken into consideration in rolling out solutions and investments in infrastructure. Third, seek technical assistance for design and implementation from development partners, and look for opportunities to learn from the knowledge and experiences of other countries. Looking ahead, it is critical that we seize this opportunity to innovate, not solely for innovation's sake, but as a way to enable transformative opportunities for the underserved. Opportunities that can empower people to improve the quality of their lives and lead to positive development outcomes. Collaboration is critical among the public and private sector. This includes essential regional and multilateral partnerships. I therefore welcome the topics of this debate. A whole of society approach is needed to address the complexities of the digital divide, including how connectivity can be optimized to help achieve the sustainable development goals and the global environmental targets. I look forward to supporting all of you in this journey towards a more inclusive world. Thank you very much, and I wish you all success. I thank the Majesty Queen Maxima of the Netherlands for her statement. I now give the floor to uh, Ms. Manjit Kripalani, Executive Director of Gateway House, Indian Council on Global Relations, and co-chair and author of T T20 Task Forces on Multilateralism and Digital Transformation, who has joined us through a live video link. Thank you. Excellencies and friends, good morning and greetings from Mumbai, India's business capital, and from Gateway House, a foreign policy think tank started by two women. In the midst of the cruel second wave of the pandemic, I see rays of hope offered by technology and digital solutions. The pandemic is making clear two things. One, that digitalization will power the developing world out of an economic crisis, and second, the digitalization of the medium, small, and micro sector is a necessary ingredient for this. Four reasons for this good news. First, the pandemic has accelerated economic reforms in many developing countries. Second, social distancing has accelerated the adoption of digitalization by governments, companies, consumers, educational institutions, and NGOs. Third, the decreasing cost of technology and prediction makes it accessible and possible. And lastly, platforms are the new institutions, now easier to build and participate in. At the cusp of this new era, how can we ensure equity in the level playing field in digitalization? There are some challenges. Digitalization is still fundamentally different in developed and developing countries. First, there's the difference between access and usage of technology. The developed world issue is usage, that is consumer privacy, security, data, protection, productivity, and the developing world needs access, digital availability, affordability, and usage of infrastructure. Second, there's a hard and soft infrastructure gap. Hard includes, includes devices, electricity, telecom, servers, data centers. Soft includes digital platforms, 
content, legal and policy measures across value chains. The developing world lacks both. Third, the world is tied down to three approaches. Proprietary digital platforms owned by a few private players, a government mandated system, and a broad regulation for consumers disconnected from their needs. The universalist approach is necessary to reconcile these worlds. One way is by making digitalization a public good. Available, affordable, accessible, auditable, scalable, with privacy embedded in its design. The UN Secretary General has laid this out in a substantive roadmap for digital cooperation. A ready and demonstrated model of the digital public goods is available in India in the form of India Stack, a set of open, modular, interoperable protocols, building blocks that allow governments, businesses, startups, and developers to utilize a unique digital infrastructure to solve hard problems. It's like the public highways which governments finance and build, on which private and public vehicles can drive, farmers can thrive, and people can prosper. The base of this is a biometric identity connected to bank accounts through which citizens receive services and subsidies, from pensions to remittances, licenses to food rations. The identity stores the digital records, but consent of sharing data lies with the individual. It's been tested during the pandemic across India's vast, diverse population and at continental scale, with food rations for migrant workers, vaccines taken, and digital certificates provided. Efforts are underway globally to adopt all or part of this model. The Philippines, Morocco, Ethiopia are working with MOSIP, or the Modular Open Source Identity Program, a not for profit foundation offering the open source code. The UN High Level Panel for Digital Cooperation has endorsed MOSIP in its June 2020 report. Once the pandemic ends, the focus will be on getting people back to work. And this is where digital public goods are critical, especially to revive the MSMEs. In developing countries, they are plagued by low digitalization and poor access to low cost and easily available credit. In the absence of data, the costs of reaching these MSMEs Underwriting, monitoring, and repayment of risks of small size loans makes it difficult for lenders to provide credit. India is democratizing credit flows to MSMEs while simultaneously driving digitalization within them. This is Microfinance 4.0. Building blocks such as the Open Credit Enablement Network bring together private participants like app based companies, credit scoring, mutual funds, insurance, telcos which can all innovate across the entire lending value chain. A word about sustainability. Massive digitalization requires mountains of silicon chips, magnets, and batteries, which need rare earths and lithium, all very difficult to mine. Data centers are responsible for 1% of global energy consumption. Chip making is water intensive, and the chemicals are polluting. The need of the hour is yes, more digitalization, but also innovation for a smart, non-pollution, polluted chip. Till that comes, we hope democratic digitalization will create new tiger economies across continents, in the Indo-Pacific, Africa, South America, the Caribbean. It's more possible now than ever before. Thank you. I thank the Executive Director of Gateway House, Indian Council on Global Relations, for her statement. We heard the last speaker for the opening segment of the high-level thematic debate. As indicated in the program, this high-level thematic debate also consists of a plenary segment and three panel discussions. The first panel discussion, entitled Ending the Digital Divide by 2030, COVID-19 Recoveries to Accelerate the Decade of Action, will be moderated by Ms. Henrietta Esterhuizen, Chair of the Multi-Stakeholder Advisory Group, Internet Governance Forum, and will take place from 10.40 to 11.30 a.m. The plenary segment will immediately follow and continue until 1 p.m. The afternoon meeting will begin with panel discussions two and three, followed by the continuation of the plenary segment. The second panel discussion, entitled Equitable Access and Digital Empowerment, Securing a Safe, Inclusive, Free, and Open Digital Future for All, 
will be moderated by Mr. Jose Ramon Lopez Portillo of the 10 member group of Technology Facilitation Mechanism and will take place from uh, 3.20 to 4 p.m. The third panel discussion entitled Greening the Digital Future, Local, Regional and Multilateral Partnership will be moderated by Ms. Rosa Vebaza, Director of the United Nations Climate Technology Center and Network and will take place from 4.10 to 5 p.m. The plenary segment will continue from 5 p.m. to be followed by the closing segment. Participants are encouraged to use the opportunity during the panel discussions to pose questions and respond in an interactive manner to the comments and presentations made by panelists and other experts. The opening segment is now concluded. I now invite members to view a short video entitled Global Assessment of Digital Cooperation and Connectivity by the United Nations Regional Commissions. Digital technologies have emerged as crucial tools to address the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and have demonstrated their importance for achieving the 2030 Agenda. However, the digital divide is stark. Only 28% of Africa's population has internet access, while 34% has broadband access. 93% of the population in East and Northeast Asia has high-speed internet access, while in Pacific Island developing countries only one-fifth does. Internet usage in the Arab region is slightly above world average, but youth internet utilization is lower at 67%. Conflicts have deteriorated connectivity. In Latin America and the Caribbean, internet access penetration is almost 70%, but fixed broadband penetration reaches only 13% of the population. In Europe, internet access at home is nearly 90%. However, Low ICT skills in many countries remain a barrier to meaningful participation in a digital society. Weak digital connectivity hinders digital inclusion. Around 95% of rural households in digitally advanced Asia-Pacific countries have access to high-speed internet, while just 29% do in low-income countries. In Latin America and the Caribbean, half of all households with no internet connection are in the two lowest income quintiles. About 46% of children aged between five and 12 years live in households with no internet. In the Arab region, vulnerable populations have fewer digital opportunities and lack e-economy culture. Gender inequality in ICT increased to 24% in 2019. Arabic internet content stands at 1%, impeding digital inclusiveness. In Africa, only 11% of households have access to computers. About 22% of women use the internet, compared with 34% of men. In Europe, internet access at home in rural areas is 10 percentage points lower than in urban areas. Women's internet use is 5 percentage points lower than men's. During the pandemic, populations with better digital connectivity were at an advantage in accessing job opportunities and receiving social assistance and communication about the virus. In Africa, social protection initiatives were hampered by the fact that more than 40% of the population lack an official identity, which is crucial for identifying and targeting beneficiaries. In Latin America and the Caribbean, teleworking is feasible for 21% of employed persons, compared with 40% in advanced economies. Frontier technology applications created new services and jobs in the Asia-Pacific region, with high-income countries enjoying 11 times higher bandwidth consumption than the region's average of 121 kilobit per second. In some Arab countries, such as Egypt, Jordan, and Morocco, where digital connectivity was extended to vulnerable groups, social assistance was successfully delivered. For years, UN regional commissions have been scaling up digital cooperation efforts. ECLAC has been supporting for 16 years the Digital Agenda for Latin America and the Caribbean, ELAC 2022, a platform to promote policy design, dialogue, and training to policymakers on digital technologies. ESCLA has pushed the digital transformation agenda in the Arab region 
through its platform for directors of e-government and partnered with ICC to support digitizing and scaling up 1 million SMEs. The Asia-Pacific Information Superhighway Initiative, led by ESCAP, aims to bridge the digital divide and boost digital transformation by promoting digital connectivity and digital data use. The African Medical Supplies Procurement Platform, supported by ECHA, has helped alleviate supply and logistical constraints by ensuring access to the pandemic portfolio medicines to Africa and the CARICOM governments. The digitalization of business processes, such as e-commerce, trade facilitation, border crossing, procurement, traceability, and e-government, developed by UN EDIFAC and UN CFAC under the purview of UNECE, have helped countries progress towards smart connectivity and the digital empowerment of citizens. Instrumental during the pandemic, these regional platforms and tools provide the needed space for policymakers to share common challenges and policy responses to mitigate impact and ensure service continuity and accelerate recovery. Digitally advanced countries in the Asia Pacific region use digital connectivity and advanced applications to mitigate pandemic contagion and socio-economic impacts. ESCAP is scaling up implementation of its Asia-Pacific Information Superhighway Initiative to bring these benefits to all. We need to work together to universalize the access to internet, promote digital transformation of production, build digital trust and security, and rethink the digital governance model within the framework of a digital welfare state. The COVID-19 pandemic has turbocharged Africa's use of both digital connectivity and digital cooperation as evidenced by the African Medical Supplies Platform, whereby all of Africa came together to pull procure uh, PPEs. And today we are using the same platform to pull procure vaccines for the continent. Digitization is surely a way out of this crisis. It's a way for Africa to recover, to reset and to deliver prosperity. COVID-19 has emphasized the digital divide amongst those equipped with the infrastructure, hardware and skills for e-business, teleworking and e-education, and those struggling to keep pace. Investments and training are needed to bridge these gaps. With a youth bulge and a high potential, the Arab region should ensure affordable and inclusive digital access, invest in digital infrastructure and develop capabilities to build forward better. As indicated in the program, we will now begin the first panel discussion entitled Ending the Digital Divide by 2030, COVID-19 Recoveries to Accelerate the Decade of Action. This panel discussion will be moderated by Ms. Henrietta Estauizen, Chair of the Multi-Stakeholder Advisory Group of the Internet Governance Forum. I warmly welcome Ms. Estauizen to this meeting along with the distinguished panelists who will all be joining us virtually. I now hand over the meeting to Ms. Estahuizen and I thank her. Thank you very much um, to the president, to all the other distinguished speakers that we've heard. And um, it's an honor to be with you on the occasion of this historical thematic debate. Um, before I introduce um, our very diverse and experienced, rich panel, um, we have some videos to, to view, which give an indication of the kind of responses that we are getting from around the world, from different stakeholder groups, from the private sector, from the academic sector, and from governments. Um, so I hereby ask um, if our tech support team can um, play these, these videos for us. And um, there'll be um, two from, from companies, the CEO from Verizon and from Intel will address us. And then we'll hear from the Digital Cooperation Organization and um, the Qatar Computing Research Institute. And after that, I will introduce our panel. Hello everyone, 2020 was a year unlike any other. 
Beyond the devastating direct health and economic impact, COVID-19 has changed many other aspects of our daily lives and the way we interact with technology. We have leapfrogged five to seven years forward in the digital revolution. Connectivity and digital technologies have become critical. It's never been more clear that mobility, broadband and cloud services underpin everything we do. They are the 21st century's infrastructure. Although this massive digital transformation has benefited many, it also has widened the existing digital divide, even at the heart of the most developed economies, such as the US or Europe. COVID-19 has brought a newfound sense of urgency toward digital inclusion. Having access to affordable digital services is no longer a luxury, but a necessity. And digital connectivity is not only fundamental to address social and economic inequality, but it also can be a key lever toward the achievements of all the 17 sustainable development goals. As many of you know, I've been long been a supporter of an 18 goal around digital access for all. Many of you in this room have been critical supporters in the goal development, including the Broadband Commission, for which I'm proud to be a commissioner on. Since there are only 17 goals, you know, I lost that battle years ago. But its importance has never been more urgent. 3.6 billion people are not online. 2 billion people don't have access to healthcare. 1.7 billion people don't have a bank account. Over 260 million kids don't have access to education. That's why we created Edison Alliance with the World Economic Forum and many of you here today. This is the goal of the Edison Alliance, to mobilize all sectors of the economy to address access, affordability, and usability of digital services because the ICT industry cannot address these challenges on its own. The Alliance is the first global mobilization of industry and public sector leaders from the ICT industry and several sectors of the economy to tackle digital desserts and ensure everyone can affordably participate in our digital economy. We launched the Alliance in January and in just a short amount of time, we have mobilized nearly 40 leaders from public and private sectors from different industries and regions. We invite you to join us as we address the, this critical challenge and create a digital inclusive world where everyone can thrive. The time is now. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Pat Gelsinger and I have the honor of serving as the CEO of Intel. I'm here to speak about the need to bridge the digital divide, thereby creating a more accessible and inclusive future for all. Our corporate purpose at Intel is to create world-changing technology that has the power to improve the life of every human on the planet. And I believe that we have an obligation to ensure that technology innovation delivers benefits for everyone, not just for a select few, irrespective of gender, ethnicity, and location. I recognize the urgency to address the digital skills gap and build more trust and responsible usages of emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence or AI to revitalize societies and economies by solving big problems in healthcare, climate, and education. Demystifying and democratizing AI technology for all is one of the keys to ending the digital divide. And this is a major area of investment for Intel. Let me share four examples of how we are working with various governments to drive for change. First, through Intel's online learning initiative and pandemic response technology initiative, we've served over a million students globally, partners to connect, engage, and evolve education in an effort we hope to extend long after the pandemic. We actively support UN efforts such as the ITU and Broadband Commission for accelerating new high-speed broadband technologies like 5G, Wi-Fi 6, that is key for digital learning and school connectivity. Second, through our AI for Youth program, we've provided AI curriculum and resources to over 100,000 high school students across 14 countries. 
we are continuing to scale the program globally. Third, through our AI for Future Workforce program, we are providing technical education to U.S. community colleges and other educational institutions to prepare non-technical students for the jobs of tomorrow. And finally, by 2030, we are committing to what we call 303030. We plan to partner with governments in 30 countries and 30,000 institutions to empower more than 30 million people with AI skills training necessary for current and future jobs and help achieve your SDG goals. But we know we can't do this alone. We must acknowledge our individual and collective responsibility. Let's join hands for improving every person's life on earth and ending the digital divide. Thank you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Dima al Yahya, and it is my honor to address you today in my capacity as the Secretary General of the newly formed Digital Cooperation Organization. I thank the UN for its leadership of today's event, which is deeply aligned with the DCO's vision. Launched in November 2020, the DCO already has seven member states with a combined population of 480 million people and a total of GDP of $1.8 trillion. Our membership includes Bahrain, Jordan, Kuwait, Nigeria, Oman, Pakistan, and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. We came together around the shared recognition that the vast potential of the digital economy can only be fully realized through innovative forms of whole of society collaboration between governments, private sector, civil society, and other stakeholders. We jointly designed the DCO to deliver exactly that. The DCO drives collective action in two integrated dimensions to create unique public value. First, we are collaboratively creating a new inclusive and dynamic cross-border digital economic space centered on the interests of citizens and reflecting the perspectives of the private sector. We intend to be a real-world laboratory of policy innovation in the digital economy. In parallel, we are driving joint multi-stakeholder initiatives to activate that space, including with transparent execution support from the private sector. Our work is oriented by four strategic goals to accelerate the growth of the digital economy collectively across all DCO member countries, to advance DCO members' digital transformation, to promote social prosperity and inclusion across the DCO digital environment, and to strengthen the collective efforts of DCO members in the global digital economy. The DCO initiatives provide clear examples of our efforts to answer the same questions that are the focus of today's high-level thematic debate. I will touch upon two of these initiatives. One is the DCO Center of Excellence for Data Flows, through which we will work towards integrated data standards among DCO member states, which that the data can flow freely with trust across our national borders for the benefit of all. Another is the DCO Observatory for Digital Empowerment, focusing specifically on women, youth, and entrepreneurs. It will monitor empowerment metrics in DCO countries, identify innovative, scalable empowerment initiatives, and drive policy advocacy to improve performance across the DCO. I hope this overview of the DCO makes clear both strategic intent and the depth of our alignment with the work of the UN on digital cooperation connectivity towards achievement of the SDGs. There are countless opportunities for us to work together, and the DCO is committed to doing so as we collectively create an inclusive digital future worthy of our people. Thank you. At the Qatar Computing Research Institute, we are proud to work with UN agencies using artificial intelligence to shed light on important social issues. Here, I would like to highlight some of these partnerships. In a project with UN OSHA and our sister organization, Education Above All, our technology to analyze social media is used to monitor attacks on schools. This helps identify incidents that are otherwise not reported. UNICEF. IOM and others have used our real-time estimates of international migration obtained through the analysis of big data. These estimates were used operationally to improve the response to the Venezuelan crisis. 
Working with DPPA, we are building a real-time search engine over diplomatic press releases of UN member states to support diplomatic staff in their work. Last but not least, we are proud to work with our friends at UNDP on joint research to support their accelerator labs and to host joint events such as our AI for Social Good workshop. Thank you for the opportunity to join the general debate on digital cooperation. I'm Gina Lucarelli, the team leader of the United Nations Development Program Accelerator Lab Network. We are a network of 91 social innovation labs embedded inside the United Nations, working to map solutions, explore new data sources, and undertake experiments to learn what works and what doesn't in sustainable development. The network is co-built as a joint venture with the Qatar Fund for Development and the Republic of Germany. And we're thrilled to work with the Qatar Computing Research Institute to explore new forms of data. We're looking at satellite data, mobile phone data, social media data, all to move towards a more real-time understanding of sustainable development. This is all the more important now, given the effects of the pandemic, which have shut down 90% of statistical offices, either fully or through working from home. And the data gap for the Sustainable Development Goals persists. We're really thrilled to join you in this conference and to learn more about our work, look at acceleratorlabs.undp.org where our lab teams work out loud on what they're learning. Equitable access to digital technologies creates opportunities and prosperity helping to achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. However, current technology access is distributed unequally creating digital divides between the haves and have-nots. At the Qatar Computing Research Institute, we work with UN agencies and NGOs to help illuminate digital divides using non-traditional data sources, such as social media data. For example, in a collaboration with the University of Oxford, we have created models that use social media advertising data to produce real-time estimates of gender differences in internet access and mobile phone ownership around the globe. These estimates fill gaps in data from the ITU and are openly accessible through the SDGs Today portal. My name is Mireya Villar. I'm the UN resident coordinator in Uruguay, a country that is part of the Digital Nations Network. When faced with COVID-19, Uruguay was able to deploy digital solutions to manage health assets in real time, to trade infection vectors, to keep children educated, to give the public reliable information and prevention advice and implement remote health services. And behind many of these, there has been, at one point or another, the support of the United Nations. That was the case when UNDP supported the e-government agency or UNESCO, the country's digital citizenship strategy. When UNICEF analyzed the interaction of children and social media or provided content to the One Laptop Per Child initiative. Or more recently, when UNDP documented the impact of digital platforms in the public debate. When FAO convened agro-industry representatives from around the region to discuss the digitalization of the sector. When ILO contributed to the recent draft law on teleworking. Or the work that UNIDO has been undertaking on Industry 4.0 as an enabler for circular economy. A new generation of UN teams around the globe are helping countries put in motion the structural transformations needed for SDG acceleration. The UN reform has endowed the resident coordinator offices with new data and partnerships capacities that allow us now to dialogue directly with actors from the data and artificial intelligence communities, the financial sector, business accelerators, as well as ICT chambers and regulators. UN agencies are leveraging their own partner networks analytical and innovation capacities, and financial resources in support of digitalization strategies that deliver on the 2030 Agenda. Whether you are a government partner, an industry representative, a digital platform, or have data solutions to share, we want to talk to you. Please reach out to the UN Resident Coordinator in your country, and we will be happy to work together. Thank you very much to everyone who has taken the time 
to to share these innovative examples of cooperation and action with us. It also demonstrates what a powerful platform the UN is for collaboration and um, cooperation. So now let me um, take advantage of the honor that I have to introduce my panel. The topic of this panel is Ending the Digital Divide by 2030, COVID-19 Recoveries to Accelerate the Decade of Action. And as you all know, the theme of this debate is whole society responses to ending the digital divide. And my panel and join, joining us um, from different parts of the world are um, Ms. Doreen Bogdan-Martin, Director of the International Telecommunications Union. And next we have my neighbor from the Sutu, Mr. Joshua Setipa, who's the Managing Director of the United Nations Technology Bank for Least Developed Countries. Then we have Mr. John Frank, Microsoft Vice President for United Nations Affairs. And after John, we have Ms. Eleanor Sarpong, Deputy Director and Policy Lead, Alliance for Affordable Internet, which is linked or based in the Web Foundation. And um, last, but definitely not least, um, because he really works at the cutting edge of, of making change, is Mr. Rodney Taylor, Secretary General um, for the Caribbean Telecommunications Union. Um, I, I, I'd like to open this panel with, I think we, we, we had a lot of really valuable background information, and I think that the message is very clear. Um, we cannot address social and economic divides if we don't address the digital divide. And similarly, I, I, we will never really redress the digital divide if we don't have a more holistic, whole society approach that looks at different facets of economy and justice and equality. Um, and I think we also come, many of us have, have been part of the World Summit on the Information Society process, or processes such as the Broadband, Broadband Commission or implementation at regional level. And I think there's something that really resonated for me in, in actually what Queen Maxima said in her video address, and that's the issue of sequencing. And I, I want to open with a question um, to the panel on what do you feel are the short-term, medium-term, and long-term goals and actions that can really have an impact, that can mitigate capacity gaps for digital connectivity? And I, and I want you to, to prioritize and focus. I think we know that there's a vast array of collaboration and, and, and initiatives and innovation, um, as we've just heard but what is it that needs to be done that will have impact, that will bring about the critical changes um, that we need to see if we are going to, to use this um, COVID recovery process to, to address the digital divide and to a more equal and inclusive world? So um, starting with that question, Doreen, what is your response? Well, thank you so much, Henriette, and a big thanks to the PGA for inviting me to contribute to this important debate. So let me start by saying, of course, the COVID crisis has framed a new global digital imperative. So post-pandemic, whatever can be digital must be digital uh, because digital confers resilience, digital supports economic performance, preserve social cohesion, and of course, digital drives growth. So to come to your questions short term, or I would say immediately, I think we need to establish that baseline for universal digital connectivity and work collaborative, collaboratively with urgency towards those agreed metrics. Of course, this is part of the UNSG's Digital Cooperation Roadmap Working Group on Universal Connectivity that I think is, is, is leading for inviting with me to contribute to this important UNICEF. debate. So, sorry, I was hearing myself echo there. So, second, I think we we need every government to develop and to commit to a clear strategy for digital development as part of their COVID nineteen response and recovery plans, and something that the private sector and other stakeholders can actively engage with. That strategy should focus not just on infrastructure, but also on the skills 
and the services to be able to make that connectivity and that infrastructure meaningful. Third, this is again on in terms of short term, that enabling regulatory environment to promote collaborative models is absolutely critical to recognize digital development as fundamental. And in each of these three, we need global solidarity. <clears throat> so medium term, it's got to be that financing piece. We got to find a way to secure that financing required. Our Connecting Humanity report estimated 428 billion would be needed to connect the unconnected. Yes, that cost is high, but the cost of inaction is even higher. The Broadband Commission's post-COVID manifesto called for a new platform to support public-private financing of broadband. And I would say forging such a platform is going to be a key focus of our upcoming World Telecommunications Development Conference. And tomorrow we're hosting our Road to Addis conversation series on finance to connect and our PGA will be joining us. So I invite you to join us for that. And then finally, the long-term piece, it's all about commitment on Riyadh. So when we think about the, the SDGs 2030, it's got to be commitment. We need to commit now to reaching universal connectivity by 2030. Thank you. very much um, for that, um, Doreen. And it sounds like, you, like you've got a cold, but, so I hope you're well. Um, next, um, reflecting on the same question, um, Mr. Joshua Setipa, um, what is your reaction to this question of, of looking at the, the, the mid, short-term and long-term actions? And I think um, you heard Doreen talk about financing, and that's your area of expertise. So I think it would also be helpful if you could particularly give your, your reflection on how you think the, the challenge of, of the financial and the investment um, and accessing the necessary funds and getting it to the right places. If you can reflect on that as well. Mr. Setipa, you have the floor. Mr. Setipa, are you there? Can you hear us? You need to unmute your microphone. My microphone Excellent. is mute on my second. Okay. <laughs> I apologize for that. On my side, it looks unmuted, but uh, I don't know what is happening. Let me start by also thanking the President of the General Assembly for inviting the UN Technology Bank for LDCs to be part of this important discussion. And also following up on, uh, on, on, uh, on what Doreen has uh, outlined and also responding to the question you've raised, we also uh, high, uh, agree with, with, with the prioritization of investment in infrastructure for connectivity and also enhancing innovation capacity in the LDCs. We also believe that investing in research and development 
uh, and aligning of, of science, technology, innovation to the SDGs is very uh, key to, to achieving uh, uh, the priorities of, 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 or that has been uh, outlined. We also believe that uh, promoting scale up. Uh, we just heard you, access, I think. Okay. Uh, promoting uh, the scale and this is Tipa. Go access. ahead. Yes, can you hear me now? I okay. Sorry. So uh, third, I was saying uh, the point I wanted to raise is that we also believe that the scale. This is to leapfrog. Is technologies and to foster entrepreneurship, which efforts have been and and technology. And that's the of the funerals, which, as you know, is scheduled for January 2022 in Qatar, must deliver a transformational development plan for the LDCs not only to recover from the losses as a result of the COVID pandemic, but also to build resilience, build productive capacities, and to structurally transform the economies and accelerate their graduation from the LDC status. Thank you very much for that. Perhaps while we're waiting on these technical issues, uh, let me proceed. Um, um, I'd like to try to draw the human-centered aspects of of the project uh, that we face. And and really, as we think about the goals, I think it's essential that we put people, not infrastructure, at the center uh, of how we think about the problem. Um, Success should be defined by the human benefits gained by being connected. Uh, And progress should be remembered by humans' broad and equitable usage of affordable connectivity and devices, their gains in digital literacy and skills, uh, and delivery of public services, such as education, healthcare, and job skills. Um, I'd like to share a photograph taken six years ago in Anuki, Kenya, a rural town 200 kilometers north of Nairobi. At the center of the photograph um, are uh, two women and behind them a small antenna tower. The women are the heroes, Tabitha Wanchuku Keru, the principal of the Gakawa Secondary School, and one of her promising students, Beatrice Dorangoa. Um, That antenna behind them provides broadband connectivity to their school and to a wide area of Nanuki similar to Wi-Fi, which extends perhaps 15 meters, the TV white space technology can reach 15 kilometers across the line of sight. In this case, that antenna can reach 30,000 people in the region. When Mawinga, the innovative ISP, began the service, the students and teachers at Gakawa School suddenly had access to the Khan Academy, Bing, Wikipedia, Google, YouTube, and more. 
The result? The students improved their scores in every single subject on the Kenya National Exam. And for the first time, the Kakawa Secondary School one of it, sent one of its students to university. The young woman in the photo, Beatrice, has now completed her university degree, and her younger sister is now enrolled in university. So human success and benefits, like improvements in education, growth in jobs, should be our measure of success. We, sh we should be setting our goals for affordable access, digital skills, and important services online. Thank you. I'm actually back, so um, apologies, everyone, for, for that technical glitch, and thanks very much to my colleagues um, for, for taking over. So, um, John, after you, um, our next response is, is from Eleanor. Eleanor, please go ahead. Thank you, anne -Rette, and it's good to have you back as well. Um, and I just want to to pick up from where uh, John has left off about the importance of having a people-centered approach. And, and, and we are very, very supportive of that. And I'll speak a, a little about that in a statement that we've recently launched uh, just yesterday. But I just wanted to focus the attention now on the short-term, uh, mid-term and long-term goals and why it's very critical. Uh, Doreen has already mentioned that we need $428 billion um, from research that's... Um, conducted by the ITU, and in order to build infrastructure to connect everyone uh, in the next nine years with universal access. And I think it's very important that we show that commitment um, at various levels. So if everybody, that is government, private sector, multilateral banks, commit to the 428 billion, I think that we can meet that critical goal. In the short to middle term, we urgently need greater commitment to investment, investment in innovative devices and new technologies, especially those that target rural areas, so that everyone has the same level of internet connection, whether they are farmers in rural Ghana or in Guatemala or even in the Amazon, they should have the same level of internet that is affordable internet that is meaningful. And when I say meaningful, uh, meaningful it means meaningful connectivity, uh, a reliable connection, that is fast, that is accessible at all times. So here are some two key actions that we can take immediately. First, we need to have very clear broadband plans. And I think Doreen alluded to this. I cannot stress this hard enough because without clear time-bound targets that focus on bringing affordable and meaningful connectivity to everyone, everyone, whether women, men, rural, urban, um, income levels, geography, we will not be able to achieve our goal. So we need to have a very clear broadband targets. Uh, the Broadband Commission targets are a very good reference point for us to get countries on track. We have a 2025 midterm and then the 2030 um, milestones. So I think it's a very good place to start off with. The second thing is that we really need to focus on the rural and urban divide. Uh, we need to actively have uh, connectivity and digital skills that target rural areas. I cannot stress that enough. We cannot have a people-centered approach when we are leaving a group of people behind. So it needs to be very inclusive. So at the Alliance for Affordable Internet, we've partnered with um, some of our members, including the APC, uh, which is Association for Progressive Communications, the Digital Empowerment Foundation in India, with CEPESA, and Facebook, to develop the Rural Broadband Policy Framework. And I really like this framework because it provides guidance on how to tackle the issue of infrastructure, of digital skills, of uh, policies in rural areas using very eight key elements. And I think that we should have more of these kind of frameworks and we are training policymakers on how to use this framework in broadband plans. And I'd like to encourage everyone to Look at our website and, and, you know, learn more about the Rural Broadband Policy Framework. Thank you, Henriette. Thanks. Thanks very much, Eleanor. Rodney, and what is your perspective? You live in an area where there are small island developing states and LDCs, and you've been part of this, of, of existing processes and plans to... to um, bridge these divides. So what is your perspective on, on goals? And I think if you can also give a perspective on why you think existing plans are not reaping the results that we would like them to reap. 
Thank you, Henriette, and, and thanks to the President of the UN General Assembly as well for inclusion of the Caribbean countries. Of course, you represent a small segment of the global community of small island developing states. Uh, as my colleague on the panel uh, from Microsoft, John, pointed out, I think it is in his case study with Africa, uh, we need to focus on rural and remote connectivity. This is important. Um, a focus on, on feasible connectivity solutions such as community networks, wireless connectivity versus fiber infrastructure, which, which can be costly. We need to focus on capacity building and development of skills and knowledge. Uh, this calls for training, of course, government intervention through policies, but also private sector partnerships, regional cooperation, global cooperation. Just as there was a global response to the COVID-19 pandemic, we have to treat inequitable access to the internet as a global issue that is a global response. And of course, uh, the UN special agencies such as the ITU has this as its focus for the World Telecoms Development Conference in 2021. And CTU is working to ensure that there's also a specific focus on small island developing states and their unique requirements based on their small size and vulnerabilities to natural disasters brought on by climate change. But there are also other NGOs such as the Internet Society, the Alliance for Affordable Internet, my, my colleague who's sitting on this panel, and others who provide support globally for capacity building, financial and technical resources to build up community networks in a sustainable way. So the issue of connectivity starts with internet access, but it goes beyond that to include devices and skills and knowledge, local content, which is also very important, uh, that is relevant and, and, and enabling environment through policies and institutions that support meaningful in interventions to the most vulnerable, vulnerable segments of our community. And so um, I would say that, I mean, it, it may sound sort of very basic, but if we're talking about, you know, bridging the, bridging the digital divide, we know that, in fact, the, it is really a, the rural and remote communities in particular that uh, do not have access. And I think we need to focus on that and support policies that promote uh, community networks that give them access. And John provides a very, very good example of that. Thank you. And um, thanks, Rodney. Um, now to move back to you, Maureen, and we'll go in the same sequence. And um, we've talked about the importance of not just multi-stakeholder cooperation, but also intersectoral linkages. And Maureen, you mentioned the need for capacity development, for financing, and Rodney has just talked about content and and how we define a meaningful content. Eleanor talked about the importance of addressing you know, rural and, and urban divides. And we need geographers, we need development finance experts, we need educationalists. What do you think we can do differently to, to get this whole society response and to, to achieve more, more intersectoral collaboration, particularly, I would say, at national level and, and near implementation, you know, as near to the ground as possible? Doreen. Thank you, Henriette. So... I think a good analogy, I'm going to pick up on, on sort of the development of the COVID vaccine. And, and we've seen here the successful global collaborative effort to develop safe COVID vaccines in record time gives us this sort of excellent playbook, I think, to work from. It really shows us that we need to embrace ways um, that are agile and open we need to pioneer creative new solutions over conventional business as usual st strategies, I would say, maintain that razor sharp focus on results and also to have the courage and the flexibility to rapidly change course if our efforts are not delivering. So whether we call it a whole of government approach, whole of society, I also like to think a whole of UN uh, it's really looking at digital, not as a single isolated pillar, but something that cuts across every economic sector of activity, whereby governments establish these digital goals, digital public goods we've heard in the beginning, that can then be adapted by different departments to deliver a range of digital services. And it really should be at the heart of every country's digital development plan. I'm gonna give a couple of quick examples. We have our Smart Village Project in Niger, which I think is a great example because it shows the on the ground, local level, 
working with local authorities, with different stakeholders, bringing meaningful digital connectivity to, to rural villages, and really tapping into the needs and the skills of local people. Also working with Estonia, GIZ and DIAL, I think that's another great example, looking at the digitization of government services for SDGs, using these reusable, secure, digital public, public goods that, that can be deployed and, and adapted. And of course, we heard from the speakers in the multi-stakeholder spotlight about partnerships. That's absolutely key. And certainly across the UN, where I say whole of UN, uh, and a couple examples here are work with GIGA and UNICEF that was mentioned by the DSG to connect every school in the world to the internet, with UNDP on digital capacity building, WHO on digital health, ILO on digital employment, UN Women, ITC on the digital gender gap. There's so many examples out there on RIET, and we really just need to collaborate. We can get it done. Thank you. Thanks, Doreen. But just let me come back to you. How do we, there are many examples, but how do we shift from this multitude of examples to the kind of results-driven approach that you are advocating? And, and how, you know, we're, we're dealing with global institutions and partnerships across industries and sectors. How do we do the kind of re-engineering that, that, that you are talking about? Okay, well, I'll come back to the GIGA example. So very bold, very ambitious, something that we talked about at the WISIS, as you remember, in 2003 and 2005, we said we were going to connect every school. We didn't do it. So now we're, we're recommitting, right? We want to connect to every school on the planet to the internet and every young person to information opportunity and choice. How can we do that? It is about measuring. It's about results. So first we need to map every school on the planet. We don't even know how many schools there are, let alone how many schools are connected to the internet. Then we need to connect those schools. We have a range of technology options available. To participate that, in that this we, important forum with uh, very distinguished panelists sorry, on behalf of the International a, Bamboo and Rotten Organization. Bamboo and Rotten this, are part of the most biodiverse and carbon rich areas um, in the Tech team, can you help us here, please? And cover up to 15 million hectares of land. There can be critical nature-based solutions. And Doreen, I'm so sorry. Um, Miguel, are you there? Can you help us? That... Yes, it seems like someone is playing a video. Um, I... Is that better? So I'm just going to, okay, to finish off on that, so the mapping piece, the connecting piece, which explores the range of, of, of technologies. We heard some great examples from our, our CTUSG. The financing piece, we got to be innovative here. We're looking at connectivity bonds. And then, of course, the empowerment piece, which is where the digital public goods come into play. And I think it's a, it's a very concrete piece where we can measure we're already seeing the results of the mapping exercise and how that can be used for, as cost savings for countries that didn't previously have that. So I think that's an example I would throw out there, Henriette. Thank you. Thanks, thanks very much, Doreen. And I think it's a, it's a really good example because it illustrates how that type of prioritization and, and engaging in a particular sector and set of issues, in this case, schools and school networks, it also becomes easier to to get that cross-section of, of sectoral engagement that, that you need. So that stands a lot. That helps a lot. And, and Joshua, um, what is your response to this question of getting a multi-sectoral engagement, particularly, I think, from those sectors that have not been as engaged in, in building the, uh, bridging the digital divide as we would like them to be? Thank you very much. I think that my starting point will also be the example that we have, uh, has been set by the global effort around uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. The fact that a disease that we did not know of or that did not exist 12 months ago, we're able to have a vaccine today. In fact, we have almost, uh, I would say, I think the last time I checked, close to 15 vaccines that are at different levels of development. Just shows, demonstrates the power of partnerships. And with that approach, 
and also as a technology bank, we are we are very happy to be part of uh, the, the Web Foundation's efforts on this. We believe that addressing the, the digital divide is uh, it requires a global effort, and through this, stakeholders uh, from the national at the national level, governments have to put in place also a whole range of interventions that will make it easy for technology to be made available at the, at the national level to, to, to bridge the divide. For example, a simple policy decision around import tariffs, being able to zero rate import tariffs on technology that you need to be able to provide access to, to internet for schools, as Doreen was saying, because it undermines the global effort if technology is made available and then it is also taxed or it is prohibitively uh, 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 that diffusion is interrupted because of, of, of tariffs or because of customs duties. So there's a whole range of interventions that at the national level are also required to complement these global efforts that we are also discussing today. It is also uh, uh, very important that we, we, as we have seen in the, over the last the decade or so, the impact of, 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 of global money, uh, of mobile money and mobile banking, what it has done to trans, transform SMEs and transform ordinary lives. Internet access can also do the same for education. Internet access can also do the same for public health systems. And if anything, it has also underlined the centrality of connectivity to achieving the SDGs. There is not a single SDG, if you go through them, which we can realistically expect to achieve in the nine years left if there is no connectivity. So I, I fully uh, I, I agree with with the, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the message is that partnerships are very central to this because the private sector, as we've heard and will continue to hear from our partners in the private sector, they are willing and able to provide the solutions. But governments also have to play their part by creating the, the, the platforms, by leveling the playing field and making sure that technology transfer takes place, making sure that policy roadblocks are removed and bottlenecks are removed, and then accessibility will be achieved. So we, we fully, fully... Uh, uh, are in line with that, and we are part of that effort by by the Web, uh, Web Foundation to to make internet access uh, uh, to, available to everyone. Thanks very much um, for that, um, Joshua. Very very helpful comments. And um, John, quick reflections on you, and we're running a little bit late, so just some some cover some some issues which have not been covered yet. Sure, I think. Uh, now, management consultants talk about you can't fix what you can't measure, but it's even, you know, sometimes we're not measuring the right thing. And so I think that we need to be measuring usage, not just coverage. And, and I think, you know, even in the United States, the Federal Communications Commission says there's only 21 million Americans that don't have access to broadband coverage. That, that's probably off by a factor too. But the more important point is, there's 150 million Americans who don't use broadband uh, at broadband speeds. That's a digital divide or gap that we need to think about around the world. And, and you know, we should be measuring usage. Is it equitable? Are we reaching you know, gender equality, uh, urban-rural divides? Those are the important things that we ought to be trying to measure. And the reason we've got these gaps is affordability. We need to look at low-cost solutions. Um, you know, there's uh, that Moinga, the um, ISP in uh, Nanuki, Kenya, they've been profitable for seven years. Their average monthly bill for their 200,000 customers around Kenya is $3 a month. And yet, they're, you know, they can be profitable delivering a service at a low cost for that, for that community. And that's incredibly important. Um, we love the airband solution, but it's just one of several approaches um, that are available. And we need to be looking at low cost solutions. We need financing, uh, to be embracing lower cost solutions. Um, and we need governments to be thinking about, are they adding costs through taxation? Are they prohibiting through spectrum regulation? Um, but if we all focus on affordability, that will have a great deal of impact to make these services accessible so that people can actually enjoy them. Thanks, thanks for that. Um, Eleanor, what is your perspective? I, I fully agree with all the, uh, you know, the comments that have been made uh, previously, especially 
on uh, on affordability because that's what we stand for, the Alliance for Affordable Internet. And uh, we do know that affordability is a big issue. But I also want to draw attention to two key um, um, issues that I think we also need to focus on, mapping uh, where the gaps are and then measuring, being able to measure the gaps. And I would like to zero in specifically on the issue of the digital gender divide. Now, for me, I see that for the digital gender divide, it's in two forms, especially um, the, the access piece and then the usage piece. And I, I believe there was a speaker, um, one of the earlier speakers uh, from India, that had mentioned that as well. So there's a digital gap in both areas which we need to focus on. I mean, if I look at sub-Saharan Africa, the digital gender gap in internet use is about 27%. And then in South Asia, it's about 51%. And even in, in Europe, you find out that women are five percentage points uh, behind men when it comes to Internet use. So clearly, there's a lot of work that we need to do in that space. And in order to have that, we need to have a, a, a great multi-sectoral uh, approach. So I think that this should not be left to finance, um, to ICT ministers alone. We need to have education ministers on board, agriculture um, uh, finance ministers, because that's where the, the money is coming from, and they, you know, and just have a whole of government approach towards this. And it needs to have a champion right from the top. So countries that have been very successful, I mean, if you see what's happening in Rwanda, in Estonia, you see that they have a champion right from the presidency. So that is very, very important. And then also being able to, when you're able to measure your targets and, and also collect the right data, you're able to track the progress that you're making. So that's why I'm very excited that at the Alliance for Affordable Internet, we've, part, we've partnered with Internet Society, ISOC, uh, to look, we are we're actually uh, com, uh, undertaking a research right now to look at the cost of excluding women from the internet. It's going to be very interesting because now we're able to tie an economic um, angle to this. And so it would be a wake-up call for a lot of countries to realize that it's very important to close the digital gender gap, not just in access, but also in usage. I also wanted to mention that um, I think Doreen talked about countries and national levels. I think that uh, it's important to look at what the Alliance for Affordable Internet is doing, uh, specifically on bringing together policymakers, uh, private sector, and, and uh, um, civil society in, in national coalitions. And it's so important that you're able to get a lot of uh, input from the national level to influence how policy is being shaped. It is so important. We are looking at all these conversations at global levels and regional levels, but we need to stress that the action, the change is going to happen at the national level. And that's where we need to focus our attention on as well to have the effects that we want to see. Thanks. Thanks, Eleanor. And also to identify the, 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 um, the policy blockages that, that Mr. Satipa was talking about. And um, Rodney, you have the last word. Sure, I'll be very brief. And uh, I think as we, as governments look to develop national digital transformation policies and strategies, it is important that uh, there are sectorial policies as well that have a, a, a digital component. So if we talk about agriculture, for example, and smart farming, uh, manufacturing and so on, and the use of robotics, um, energy and smart energy grids. So there has been underlying theme of uh, technology of digital transformation within each sector. And those persons who, because we talk about farming, you have rural communities and so on. So they, they need to be given not just the tools, but the, the knowledge, the know how, how to leverage this technology because it's a different way of farming, it's a different way of managing your energy requirements and your water resources. So uh, bottom line, there has to be an underlying theme in every sector with respect to technology, the use of leveraging technology for, for transformation. Thank you. Um, thanks, thanks very much um, for that, Rodney, and everyone else. Are there any questions from member states? I don't see uh, any indication from from um, any member states. So we need to bring the panel to a close. But I really just want to give each panelist literally thirty seconds. And um, what would you like member states, members of the General Assembly, to to take away with them? Um, from this discussion, very briefly, 30 seconds each. Starting with you, Doreen. 
<laughs> that, that's a tough one, Henriette. Um, I think that the time is now. Uh, the urgency has never mattered more. And as we come out of COVID, connectivity cannot go to the bottom of the agenda. It was a nice to have, it's a must have. And so it's, it's, this is the moment to join forces and close the digital divide. We cannot afford to have 3.7 billion people unconnected should we have yet another crisis in the years to come. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Satipe. We must connect and bring actors together and we must make connections and build strong connections between government and, uh, and its citizens. We must also ensure that different stakeholders work together and also ensure that initiatives must be country-led and supported by scientific and reliable evidence. I think that is uh, at the heart of what we're trying to do. Thank you very much. Thanks. And John, very briefly. We need to put people at the center of how we think about the connectivity gap and the human benefits and, and really recognize that business, NGOs and governments need to work together in a multi-stakeholder way to make this happen. Um, we're all committed to it. We need to act. Eleanor? Yeah, um, I also would like to echo that we need collective action, really, and uh, greater commitment. Uh, we, we need to really walk the talk, and that's why I'm very happy that we've partnered with uh, several organizations, including Microsoft, CTU here, um, to say that uh, in a statement that we're leaving no one behind. We need a people-centered approach to achieve meaningful connectivity. And the time is now. And we can get that 428 billion if we partner together in resources and in capacity. Rodney. Thank you very much. And I, I want to say that I think we need to see these 3 billion unconnected um, people around the globe as also an economic opportunity. So this is not just about being idealistic. But it represents an un untapped market, an opportunity for, to create livelihoods. It represents a market. It provides incentives for the private sector to make investments to get them connected. Because these are customers. Uh, these are people who you know, can access knowledge and, and access goods and services. And I think it's an imperative. The UN is well-placed through specialized agencies, such as the ITU, to drive this uh, globally. And I think just as we saw the response, the global response to the COVID-19 pandemic, we need to treat the issue of the digital uh, divide as a, as, a, as a global crisis. And I think we also need to work response. Thank you. Thanks very much, everyone, for your inputs. And um, this is the end of the panel. And I look forward to continuing this discussion um, throughout the year and also at the Global Internet Governance Forum, which will take place in December in Poland as a hybrid event online and face-to-face. -face. Goodbye, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. I thank, thank the moderator, the panelists, and all the participants for their active engagement in the interactive panel discussion. I would also like to express my appreciation to all participants for their invaluable insights and contribution to the deliberations on this important matter. The General Assembly will now begin the plenary segment. I now invite members to view the pre-recorded statement of His Excellency Saulos Chilima, Vice President and Minister of Economic Planning and National Reforms of the Republic of Malawi, on behalf of the least developed countries. Your Excellency Vokan Boski, President of the UN General Assembly, your Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. I have the honor to deliver these remarks on behalf of the least developed countries, LDCs. At the outset, I would like to align these remarks with those made by Guinea on behalf of Group of 77 and China. Allow me to take this opportunity to express gratitude to the President of the General Assembly for bringing us all together on such a crucial and most relevant topic. Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, as humanity progresses, technology and its advancement are becoming a key driver of innovation and change. 
the emergence of frontier technology such as artificial intelligence, robotics, biotechnology, and nanotechnology has fundamentally altered business models in all dimensions of sustainable development. In the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, technology has emerged as a bridge and hope for sustainable development. We are, however, concerned that not all countries are seizing the opportunities offered by the modern technologies. The COVID-19 lockdowns attest that many LDCs are unable to avail online facilities to remote learning and working, primarily due to insufficient digital connectivity and infrastructure services. Even prior to the pandemic, LDCs faced significant lags in major indicators related to science, technology, and innovation. In the LDCs, the ratio of research and development expenditure as a share of GDP is less than 0.6% compared to more than 2% in the developed countries. Only 19% of the population of LDCs have access to internet as compared to 87% in the developed countries. Low internet connectivity in the rural areas, high cost of using the internet, lack of local content and inadequate skills in LDCs are hampering LDCs prospects in reaping the benefits of digital technologies. Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, as we approach the fifth UN conference for LDCs, technology utilization and enhanced financial support are key prospects for capacity building, resilience to risks, and maximization of progress in the last decade of action. In this regard, the LDCs wish to highlight the following. Number one, we recommend that by 2030, every person should have affordable and meaningful internet access and digitally enabled public services in line with the SDG's target on education, health, decent work, and economic growth. Two, we recognize the vital work of the UN Technology Bank for LDCs in improving LDCs scientific research and innovation. We therefore encourage our partners to provide support to the Technology Bank to enable it attain its full potential. Number three, we recognize the recent surge in modern technologies and the opportunities for sustainable development. We therefore call upon our development partners to deliberately facilitate and support technology in transfer in order to improve innovation and accelerate development in the LDCs. And fourth, we take note of the formidable challenge in closing the technological divide and recognizing that closing this divide is dependent on action in other sectors such as energy, FDI and education, we are calling for sustained investment in these areas anchored by collaboration and cooperation which enables LDCs to build capacity and develop their research and sustainable development. Excellencies and distinguished ladies and gentlemen, sustainable and enhanced financing and cooperation remains crucial in closing the digital and technological divide, hence enabling the ODCs to successfully fulfill the 2030 Agenda. I therefore look forward to the General Assembly's continued engagement in the processes towards the fifth UN Conference on LDCs, which will be held in Doha, Qatar, in January 2022. I thank you for your attention. I thank the Vice President and Minister of Economic Planning and National Reforms of the Republic of Malawi for the statement just made. I now invite members to view the pre-recorded statement of His Excellency Mark Phillips, Prime Minister of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana. Mr. President, Guyana commends you for organizing this timely, high-level thematic debate 
on digital cooperation and connectivity. The unprecedented changes occasioned by the COVID-19 pandemic have reinforced the importance of digital technology and its intricate link to the workforce, education, healthcare, and e-commerce. The pandemic compelled us to transition from the conventional means of earning, learning, and accessing essential services to working remotely, learning online, and procuring services virtually. While some countries were able to make the transition almost seamlessly, many developing countries are being left behind owing to the lack of adequate ICT infrastructure inter alia. This highlights the stark digital divide between the developed and developing world. It is therefore urgent for us to work collaboratively at the local and international levels to address these inequalities. Mr. President, with less than 38% of our population using the internet, the government of Guyana is working closely with international and bilateral partners to increase access. Our strategy includes the liberalization of the ICT sector, expansion of the fiber optic network, subsidized access to poor households, provision of appropriate technology to schools, and the establishment of an International Institute of Technology in Guyana. We have already established a number of smart classrooms to cater to the educational needs of students in a virtual environment. The government is also working to improve service delivery to the public through digital government services. Our legislative framework to create an enabling ICT environment is being modernized with a new Telecommunications Act and Public Utilities Commission Act, allowing for a coordinated, open, and competitive telecommunication sector. Guyana also enacted the Cybercrime Act in 2018 to allow for investigation and prosecution of cybercrime offenses and related matters. Mr. President, in positing solutions to end the digital divide, we must address the urban-rural gap in digital technology, as well as the limited accessibility of the most vulnerable groups in society. Expansion of affordable ICT services to rural areas, including satellite technology and training in the use of digital technology, must therefore be prioritized. We must also work to strengthen policies and legislation to combat cybercrime so that the dangers resulting from the wrong use of digital technology do not outweigh its benefits. In this regard, the government of Guyana supports the call in the UN 75 declaration to improve digital cooperation and work towards a common vision of an open, free, and safe digital future for all. I thank you. I thank the Prime Minister of the Cooperative Republic of Guyana for the statement just made. I now invite members to view the pre-recorded statement of Her Excellency Magritte Vestager, Executive Vice President of the European Commission of the European Union. Dear President Boschkia, Thank you very much for inviting me to this important event. It's a great pleasure to be with you, although from miles away. We strongly welcome the UN Secretary General's roadmap on digital cooperation and the decision to set up the office of the UN Tech Envoy. It aligns with the importance of the digital transformation of our economies and societies. The UN and the European Union share a common ambition to address the pressing issues of the global digital divide. Because technology can help us, finding health solution, fighting terrorism, mitigating climate change, or predict natural disaster and future pandemics. It gives us a real chance to deliver on the sustainable development goals. Technology can facilitate inclusion and give people access 
to fundamental services around the world. We have seen that countries that expand internet access enable more children to be educated, more women to get a job. So to reap the full potential of new technologies, we have to close the global digital gap. And how we do it will be just as crucial. Because we know that digitization also comes with serious risks. They range from mass surveillance and cyber attacks on critical infrastructure to disinformation that polarize societies and undermine trust. We've seen technology used to repress minorities, extract people's personal data without their consent, or stifle the freedom of expression. It is for this reason that digitization and human rights must go together in everything we do. They are two sides of the same coin. And this is what we have been promoting in our various proposals to shape the next digital decade. The EU's new cooperation programme will combine strong standards for trustworthy and safe digital space with financial resources for new digital infrastructure. We will help our partners develop their own strong governance frameworks, including in areas such as cybersecurity and data protection. For a fair and inclusive digital transformation, we need an effective multilateral system. This challenge is too big to be addressed by any country alone. We can only achieve it together. So in the coming years, we will need a revamped and more politically relevant Internet Governance Forum. Together, we will preserve the open, unfragmented and free nature of the Internet. A splintered web would be to the detriment of our human development. We therefore need to reinforce institutions that promote the open Internet, making them more effective and while reaffirming their original missions anchored in the UN Charter. And we look forward to working with all of you to achieve just that. Thank you. I thank the Executive Vice President of the European Commission for the statement just made. I now invite members to view the pre-recorded statement of His Excellency Michael Fedorov, Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of Digital Transformation of Ukraine. United Nations General Assembly, President and Delegates, thank you for the opportunity to represent Ukraine in such an important discussion as Digital Divide Bridge is a call not only to Ukraine, but to the whole world. For Ukrainian government, digital transformation is a priority in all spheres. In 2019, we created the Ministry of Digital Transformation of Ukraine, and our goal is to create a successful digital country with equal opportunities for everyone. Today, Ukraine is the first country in the world with legit digital passports and fourth in Europe with digital driver's license. We developed a digital country brand, DIA. Our goal is not only online services development, but also equal access to them for everyone. We work on accessible digital opportunities for all groups of people, including people with disability, elderly, youth and young parents. Ministry of Digital Transformation conducted a complex research study on digital divide. Results show unaccessible digital technologies and lack of basic digital literacy as key factors for digital divide widening. First step for this problem solving is internet. We will launch digital services for Ukrainians, but should also create the opportunities for the whole country to use them. That is why one of the ministry's goals is to provide the high-speed internet access to 95% of citizens. Now, we actively cover Ukraine with high-quality 4G and already start R&D work on 5G launch. This year, we'll cover with optic fiber around 6,000 social infrastructure objects, schools, hospitals, libraries in small villages and rural areas. Another call we face is digital literacy and trust to digital services. So we launched a DIA digital literacy project. 
Our plan is to teach 6 million Ukrainians basic digital skills in three years. We also develop digital accessibility strategy and aim to create a real barrier-free environment for everyone. At the same time, talking about high-tech solutions and digitalization, we always remember our main goal to create a safe online environment for our citizens and actively follow it. I hope today countries will find common ground for cooperation to develop new effective instruments for digital divide overcome. From our side, Ukraine does everything possible for it and for equal digital access for our citizens. I thank the Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of Digital Transformation of Ukraine for the statement just made. I now invite members to view the pre-recorded statement of His Excellency Baghdad Musen, Minister of Digital Development, Innovations and Aerospace Industry of Kazakhstan on behalf of the landlocked developing countries. Mr. President, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to deliver a statement on behalf of the group of 32 landlocked developing countries. The COVID-19 pandemic has highly facilitated the digital connectivity transforming the delivery of essential services and the rising requirements of social distancing. Social economic processes are undergoing significant changes moving to remote learning and distance work, telemedicine, to mention a few. It has also highlighted the need for massive use of digital technologies in transit and customs procedures. Unfortunately, most of the LDCs have not experienced these benefits, while the COVID-19 pandemic has explicitly demonstrated that many countries are faltering even more drastically. At the moment, the UNCTAD predicts that by the end of the next decade, the scales of our integration into the digital economy will predetermine the levels of growth, productivity gains, and human development. With that in mind, the international community should actively help developing countries to diminish the connectivity gap and new forms of inequality to reach the goals of 2030 agenda. Mr. President, around 80% of Europe's population is, is estimated to be online in 2019. Instead, the comparable figure for Sub-Saharan Africa was below 25%. Moreover, for landlocked developing countries, more or less on the same part below 26%. These numbers imply serious obstacles for further advances in modernization, stipulating ever-rising poverty, hunger, and calamities of climate change, with impending conflicts, disruption, and instability. A closer view of LLDCs reveals the more widening social, economic, and techno technological inequalities as a result of digital divide. These problems are sharpened by logistical impediments and bottlenecks, lack of infrastructure and remoteness, the absence of broadband facilities, as well as lack of bank accounts and credit cards. In many LLDCs, there are neither the consumer protection laws to safeguard e-commerce and trade. However, e-commerce is only one facet of the evolving digital economy. The productive sectors of economy are undergoing major transformation by technological platforms, data analytics, 3D printing, and the so-called Internet of Things. By 2030, the IoT-connected devices will reach 125 billion uh, US dollars compared, compared to 27 million in 2017. And yet, along the positive implications of rapid pace of digital technologies, half of the world's population still remains unconnected to the internet. Let me brief you on our major national project, a full-scale digital transformation, DigiTN. It's so-called digital era lifestyle. By 2025, we are planning to cover 100% our territory with a highly quality internet and increase investments in IT industry up to 
1.2 billion US dollars per year, establishing IT schools in the regions, while the total export of IT products and services will reach half billion million a half billion dollars that will create 100,000 new jobs. Mr. President, there is the recent midterm review of the Vienna Program of Action for LDCs has indicated that despite collective efforts, the LDC still remain marginalized, marginalized in global trade. The UN membership adopted a political declaration which includes a call for action of accelerating the implementation of the VPOE, VPOA in its remaining five years. As a follow-up, last September, the ministers of LLDCs adopted the roadmap for the accelerated implementation of the VPOE with a focus on ICT and digital economy, digital connectivity, among other priorities. The roadmap will be leading document evolving with the UN's support the LLDCs. In addition, the LLDCs call on multilateral and regional development banks, related financial institutions and private investors to closely interact with the UN system to generate necessary investments and catalyzing private finance, finance in LLDCs. This will eventually contribute to decreasing the gaps digital connectivity and stimulate additional inputs to drive the projects mentioned in the roadmap for the BPOE. In my concluding remarks, let me highlight that the group of LLDCs underlined the access to the internet open up new opportunities in all vital sectors of national economies, such as trade, agriculture, banking, education, science and technology, healthcare, and others. Modern information technologies represents viable instrument to eradicate poverty, promote gender equality, strengthen human capital, and reduce existing social and economic dis disparities faced by the most vulnerable countries of the world. In sum, the LLDCs are committed be part of the multilateral effort to ensure digital justice for all and share the benefits of digital transformation. Thank you. I thank the Minister of Digital Development, Innovations and Aerospace Industry of Kazakhstan for the statement just made. I now invite members to view the pre-recorded statement of His Excellency Evel Skinari, Minister for Development, Cooperation and Foreign Trade of Finland. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to take part in this thematic event. Today's topic is of central importance for Finland. High quality, secure infrastructure, from connectivity to data security, forms a critical basis for resilient economies and societies. It's crucial for reaching the SDGs and for recovery during these times of COVID. To achieve universal connectivity, we need broad-scale partnerships, more financial resources and cutting-edge innovations. Our efforts must include all sectors of society in order to be sustainable. Finland is particularly concerned about the gender digital divide. We must improve access to affordable devices and reliable internet connections, especially for women and girls. Finland co-leads the Generation Equality Action Coalition on Technology and Innovation for Gender Equality, a groundbreaking five-year campaign. It aims to halve the gender digital divide by 2026 by improving access to technologies and by promoting universal digital skills. The coalition also aims to create gender trans transformative innovations and help elim eliminate online gender-based violence. These targets are ambitious 
and I would like to welcome all partners to join us in this task. Ladies and gentlemen, Finland is a world-leading digital society and economy. A human-centric and whole-of-society approach has promoted Finland's own digital trans 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 transportation throughout the years. It builds on competencies and the responsible use of core technologies such as 5G, artificial intelligence and Internet of Things. Citizens and their needs are at the very center of Finland's national digital strategies. Digital skills are strongly prioritized. Courses such as the elements of AI and the ethics of AI are available to anyone online. Finland is committed to global digital cooperation. The Finnish government's new Africa strategy targets strengthened partnerships in areas such as digital transportation. Finland joins the EU's external digital cooperation under a Team Europe approach. The UN Secretary General's roadmap for digital cooperation presents an important platform for global multi-stakeholder collaboration. Finland supports this comprehensive agenda. The international community must find ways to bridge digital divides and I am confident that together we can make an impact. Finland is eager to collaborate with you all. Thank you. I thank the Minister for Development and Cooperation and Foreign Trade of Finland for the statement just made. I now invite members to view the pre-recorded statement of His Excellency Ravi Shankar Prasad, Cabinet Minister, Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology of India. President of the General Assembly, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, in 2020, the year of the COVID-19 pandemic, the world embraced digital transformation at a pace never witnessed before. The pandemic has resulted in societies reimagining technology's critical role in how we work, learn and live. The pandemic has not only laid thread bare the issue of digital divide, but more importantly, recast our view of digital access as a critical component to an equitable society. Technology is meant to be the great equalizer, not a source of division. Almost half the world's population does not have access to high-speed broadband and is hence deprived of the access to virtual platforms, telemedicine, distant education and e-payments. Technology is neutral, but its impact will depend on choices that we make today in its application, access and governance. Hence, it becomes critical that we make the digital revolution inclusive by creating an environment where nobody is left behind. In India, we took a concerted decision to adopt a whole of society approach to digital technology and improved public services, such as engagement and accountability. In 2015, we launched Digital India with the aim to bring digital inclusion and empower ordinary citizens by leveraging technology-based solutions that are affordable and easy to use. Today, India has the second largest internet user base. We are the second largest mobile manufacturer and offer cheapest internet data traffic in the world. We aim to develop India as a $1 trillion digital economy by 2025. Digitization has helped us in accelerating financial inclusion and bridging the gender divide. This has been made possible by linking bank accounts, digital identity and mobile phones in India has ensured a near universal access to bank accounts. We have propelled the poor, especially over 200 million Indian women, into the mainstream financial system, accelerating their economic empowerment through direct benefit transfer. 
in last six years, nearly 400,000 common service centers have been set up in rural areas of India. These are digital service delivery kiosks to help those who cannot access digital services on their own. The COVID-19 pandemic has also brought to the forefront the critical need for cutting-edge technology tools and innovations in the area of tele-education and tele-medicine. The expedited development of contact and tracing application called Arogya Saitu, which means health bridge, and COVID app for rollout of vaccines are outcomes of India's effort. In the spirit of South South cooperation, we have also launched the Pan Africa e network, which aims to provide free tele education and telemedicine services to developing countries. Digitization can support waves of change that could dramatically shift to a more efficient governance system. We need to make technology an enabler for sustainable development, economic growth, social inclusion, and environment sustainability. We need to develop a more equitable and effective digital ecosystem by continuous skill development, increased access, and most important, affordable of digital technology. This will enable us to correct the structural injustices and ensure that the digital revolution is inclusive and empowering. I thank the Cabinet Minister, Minister of, e of Electronics and Information Technology of India for the statement just made. I now invite members to view the pre-recorded statement of His Excellency S. Iswaran, Minister for Communications and Information of Singapore. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, I would like to thank the President of the General Assembly, His Excellency Volkan Bosker, for convening this important debate. Building on the UN Secretary General's roadmap for digital cooperation, I will outline three attributes we should strive for to end the digital divide. Inclusiveness, innovation, and interoperability. First, digital transformation must be inclusive. Internationally, we must recognize the diversity of national circumstances. The UN roadmap for digital cooperation is a good start. UN platforms like the Internet Governance Forum should continue to have a strong focus on digital inclusion to facilitate the sharing of experiences and actions across countries. In this regard, Singapore has a digital readiness blueprint that could serve as a useful reference. It guides our efforts to equip our people with digital access, skills, and know-how. It is a comprehensive document that covers all segments of our society, from children in low-income households to senior citizens and micro SMEs. Second, we must be innovative in our approach to end the digital divide. The accelerated pace of digital transformation has created opportunities, but is also profoundly disruptive to some and requires complex trade-offs. In response, we need creative solutions that harness diverse capabilities and insights. This would enable us to fulfill the UN 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development to leave no one behind. To this end, Singapore recently launched our Digital for Life movement, a whole-of-nation effort endorsed by public, private, and people partners. The movement empowers the community to lead ground-up efforts and co-create solutions to foster digital inclusion. Finally, for a thriving digital future, we need an interoperable digital framework. Digitalization democratizes the economy and interoperability enables individuals and enterprises to gain access to global digital opportunities. In our region, ASEAN is facilitating cross-border data flows to unlock new business opportunities, especially for our SMEs, through initiatives like the ASEAN Data Management Framework. Allow me to conclude. While COVID-19 has unlocked the value of years' worth of digital transformation, it has also heightened the risk of divisions between the digital haves and have-nots. Singapore will continue to work closely with fellow member states to forge a shared digital future that is inclusive, innovative, and interoperable. Thank you. I thank the Minister for Communications and Information of Singapore for the statement just made. 
Distinguished delegates, I would like to inform you that in order to hear as many speakers as possible, the meeting will continue till 1.15 p.m. I would like to thank the interpreters for their support in this regard. I now invite members to view the pre-recorded statement of His Excellency Eva Maria Limetz, Minister for Foreign Affairs of Estonia. Your Excellency, Mr. Volkan Boskir, President of the General Assembly, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to be joining you today from Tallinn for this high-level thematic debate on digital cooperation and connectivity. A few months ago, Estonia celebrated the 25th birthday of the Tiger Leap Programme, a national education digitalization initiative that gave impetus for the development of an open, transparent and inclusive digital society, leaving no one behind. Within a few years, all schools in Estonia were connected into the Internet, public Internet access points were opened all over the country, and in cooperation with the government and the private sector, the public was taught how to use the Internet and how to do it safely. Today we are facing another digital leap. The COVID-19 caused crisis has put digital technologies higher in our agendas than ever before. It has boosted the development of innovative digital tools among governments and private sector alike. I believe that last year has also forced us to rethink digital transformation. The COVID-19 crisis has proved that we as people, businesses, governments and countries share similar problems and that our solutions to these problems are similar too. Online education and distance learning, telemedicine and remote healthcare, digital authentication and signature, COVID-19 applications, these are just a few examples of digital responses to the issues we all face. This means that we do not need to invest in new duplicative and costly digital developments, but follow on from what is already in place. Here, Estonia together with Germany, ITU and Digital Impact Alliance are collaborating to develop a digital governance reference architecture. GoStack consisting of different open source digital governance building blocks that are adjustable, replicable and scalable and that will become accessible for everyone. Basing on our 20 years of experience with data governance and sharing, Estonia is actively engaging also with the WHO to create a global trust framework. The aim of this initiative is to provide cost-effective and sustainable solutions to global health data interoperability, taking into account the maturity of all the country situations, particularly in low resource settings. The United Nations Secretary General's roadmap for digital cooperation comes at the critical point for digitalization, as digitalization requires global partnerships and collaborations. Estonia contributes actively to this effort, particularly through the Trust and Security Roundtable, and is also glad to cooperate with the Digital Public Goods Alliance. I would like to thank you once again for this important event today. Thank you. I thank the Minister for Foreign Affairs of Estonia for the statement just made. I now invite members to view the pre-recorded statement of His Excellency Abdullah Shahid, Minister for Foreign Affairs of Maldives. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the COVID-19 pandemic has been one of the most challenging crises faced by mankind in recent history. It has reached every nook and corner of the world, costing millions of lives and driving millions more into poverty and loss of livelihoods. This global pandemic has not only caused a tsunami of socio-economic issues in its wake, but it has also brought to light the existing inequalities amongst us. One such inequality is the digital divide. When the initial wave of the pandemic hit, we were confined within the parameters of our homes. We had no choice but to resort to digital screens to connect us to the outside world. Digital connectivity became a necessity overnight. Today, as we seek to overcome the barriers that stand in our way, we witness the paradigm shift in digitalization. The entire world is adapting to innovative technology as we aim to build back better from the negative socioeconomic impacts of the pandemic. The continuity of public services 
such as education has become reliant on the inter internet. Digital economies have become the new modern to achieve the SDG goals. Societies have transformed based on the extent and strength of digital modes of work. These structural transformations have been rapid with no lapse to have second thoughts. However, the transition to these extraordinary circumstances is far from smooth. Not everyone amongst us is equipped to embrace our digital lifeline. Many of the vulnerable groups within our societies have been left behind in terms of connectivity. We must address this digital divide rampant across the world by increasing worldwide cooperation to expand digital connectivity. We must support the COVID-19 adaptation and recovery strategies that leave no room for technology facilitated abuse, harassment, targeting of women and children, and the spread of misinformation. Excellencies, the Maldives as a small island developing state has put a brave fight against the detrimental impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. With over a thousand islands scattered across 300 kilometers in the Indian Ocean, the lockdown, the closing of the borders, both international and internal, as well as halting of transportation services have been extremely challenging for us. Our economy came to a standstill and we were at the brink of a bottomless financial crisis. Despite the challenges, the government under the administration of President Ibrahim Mohamed Saleh took concrete measures to facilitate continuous and equitable access to public service. Schools were closed, but teaching and learning continued through means of technology. Healthcare services continued uninterrupted through online consultations. Banking services were provided through online transactions. Government and private sector employees continued to work from home through remote setups. Small and medium enterprises were encouraged to thrive using digital connectivity. Every effort was being made to ensure timely information reaches the most remote corners of the country so that no one is left behind. The Maldives remains true to the digital transformation taking place today. We are committed to ensuring countrywide access to digital connectivity and conveniences. Our country offers high broadband and mobile internet services that demand quality and efficiency. About 63% of the population of the Maldives uses the internet, according to studies of 2019, which is a higher proportion than any other South Asian country and peers outside the region as well. This number would have undoubtedly increased as an effect of the pandemic. However, efforts need to be made to decrease the digital divide between the capital and the islands. Excellencies, it is crucial that governments and world leaders take urgent and immediate action to connect everyone in a safe and secure manner, irrespective of location or means. This would allow everyone to participate in newly emerging digital growth engines and associated opportunities, inclusive of measures undertaken to recover from this pandemic. As a new era of digital connectivity dawns upon us, we must understand the challenges of digitalization, better to cater solutions that are both progressive and sustainable. It is important now, more than ever, for us to adopt a whole of government as well as a whole of society approach to shape a common digital future beneficial for all, leaving no one behind. I thank you. I thank the Minister for Foreign Affairs of the Maldives for the statement just made. I now invite members to view the pre-recorded statement of His Excellency Shibli Faraz, Minister of Science and Technology of Pakistan. Excellencies, distinguished participants, colleagues and friends, good morning, good afternoon and good evening. I would like to extend my gratitude to the President of the General Assembly for convening today's meeting. The fact that we are convened today virtually 
is one indication of the power of digital technologies to bring people together in search of, for solutions to sustainable development in these most difficult times. Digital technologies have made unprecedented progress, yet this progress has been unequal. COVID-19 has further highlighted the profound impact of the digital divide. Only a little over half of the world's population uses the internet, which is around 53%. Important digital divides exist between regions and countries. The 3.6 billion persons still offline are overwhelmingly located in Africa and the Asia Pacific. Last year, 87% of individuals in developed countries were online, compared to 19% in the least developed countries. The high levels of concentration of resources, skills and capacities that are required for digital transformations are likely to further widen digital divides and income inequalities. Instead of contributing towards more inclusive and sustainable development. Excellencies in Pakistan, we have leveraged technology and data analytics to successfully implement a national social protection program for the most marginalized people. Through the Ahsas Compassion Program, we have disbursed emergency cash assistance to 6.6 .6 million families throughout the country. The majority of these beneficiaries are women. The entire design, application and execution of this program is a practical example of how digital platforms can be utilized for financial inclusion. COVID-19 proved to be the asset test of our efforts. Using the same platform, we successfully implemented a $1.2 billion relief package to deliver emergency cash to over 15 million families, covering over 100 million people. Excellencies, four mega trends in the digital space should be of particular concern to all of us. One, the explosive growth of data volumes and their cross borders flow. Two, the dominance of the ICT business environment by huge data management corporations exclusively based in just few countries. Three, the fast pace and unpredictability of change in digital technologies and other frontier technologies. Four, finally, the ever stronger momentum driving digitalization and its pervasive impact on economic, social, and cultural change. To overcome the challenges posed by these trends, we needed first and foremost to overcome the digital divide. We need to ensure that the voices of developing countries are heard so that they can meaningfully participate in the debate. Second, the private sector controls around 70% of the global digital technology related infrastructure. It is essential to address some of the questionable policies and practices of big technology companies. Third, we should also focus on tax policies, transfer pricing, free and free free and fair trade as well as on cyber crimes, cyber security threats, disinformation, propagation of hate and violence. National and international regulatory frameworks are essential for equitable technology governance and development. Fourth, 
developing countries strategies should not play catch up aiming for sunset development models they should aim to leapfrog into the digital era focusing on broadband g5 artificial intelligence quantum computing etc there are ready examples of success especially in asia fifth in the digital age smes and service industries including in developing countries can integrate more easily into the world economy and supply chains sixth we need effective mechanisms of cooperation and governance to prevent fragmentation of the digital landscape interoperability of data and standards is vital for global and sustainable development finally we must be concerned that technology including digital technology has emerged as a major issue generating friction and tensions between the major countries a divided digital world will be more dangerous world this would be disastrous for realization of the sgds i thank you all i thank the minister of science and technology of pakistan for the statement just made I now invite members to view the pre-recorded statement of Her Excellency Karen Kudinen, Minister of Information and Communications Technology of Colombia. Cordial saludo, soy Warmest greetings. I'm Karen Abdinen, Minister for IT and Communication in Colombia. I would especially like to greet the President of the General Assembly of the United Nations, Volkan Bosquier, the ministers Excellencies and all those who are here in this space for a debate on how to bridge the digital divide. The government of President Ivan Duque is working tirelessly to narrow that gap. We know that we have to continue working to connect this country, achieving 70% connectivity, especially in rural areas and the more remote areas where we can give a boost to undertakings in the countryside where our children can also study thanks to this connectivity. Thus, we are investing more than 3 billion pesos to connect Colombia, where we have connected more than 342,000 new homes subsidized by the government. Also, more than 3,658 new antennas. 15,000 schools will be connected between now and February next year. There are internet plans for students and enterprising women, but we have to connect meaningfully. We have to train all the digital skills that are need for digital transformation. And we have a revolutionary program for digital skills, training 100,000 programmers. We're boosting 10,000 companies with training so that they can have digital transformation with our programs of sell online and virtual stores. In Colombia, we work every day to communicate, to reinvigorate, to connect because connectivity equals equity. It means opportunities. And we believe that all countries should know that we are eager and ready to help promote connectivity and technology. I'd also like to strengthen the point that in our program for programmers, those 100,000 programmers that we already have with that first cut, 51% are working. So let's continue connected and remember connectivity and technology mean equity. I thank the Minister of Information and Communications Technology of Colombia for the statement just made. 
I now invite members to view the pre-recorded statement of His Excellency Artus Toms Bless, Minister of Enviro Minister for Environment Protection and Regional Development of Latvia. President of the General Assembly, Excellencies, Honorable Delegates. In the era of digital transformation, we have to ensure that our fundamental values, human rights, and freedoms are preserved, while we also have to be able to identify new ones generated by digitalization. We have to put our best efforts to ensure that digital transformation is beneficial and inclusive for all countries and all people, bridging the existing digital divides including digital gender divide. Lessons we continue to learn from the COVID-19 pandemic serve as a catalyst for giant leap in the digital transformation. To make a leap in digital transformation, as well as to tackle digital divides, access and sufficient infrastructure capacity are required. Let me remind that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was drafted with foresight to include and to accommodate future technological developments through which individuals can exercise their rights, including the economic, social, and cultural rights. It means that today the access to digital infrastructure and content have to be a part of our human rights. However, access is not enough. Significance of digital infrastructure is unquestionable. However, Benefiting fully from it is not possible without digital skills for all in digital age. Digital skills, particularly for people in vulnerable situations, should be seen as a part of social policy. In the digital era, our social policies need to support the basic needs of people in vulnerable situa situations, including digital basic skills we need to break the stereotypes by highlighting that women and men can perform digital jobs equally well. As an example, in Latvia, a national network of digital agents called Riga Tech Girls educate and inspire girls and women about STEM subjects, including technology. Promoting successful women IT specialists as role models is an important element. Excellencies. We live in the time of green and digital transformation, an ongoing process that continuously evolves as advancement in technology and changes in our habits raise new opportunities as well as risks. Therefore, to balance the needs of industrial breakthrough and environmental fragility, our digital future requires use of digital technologies and data in a responsible manner. Green and digital transition need to be accompanied with relevant programs to invest in skills and reskilling for green jobs and transformation. Latvia is ready to share its experience in digital transformation with developing countries to advance the achievement of the sustainable development goals. Thank you. I thank the Minister for Environmental Protection and Regional Development of Latvia for the statement just made. I now invite members to view the pre-recorded statement of Her Excellency Erika Moines, Minister for Foreign Affairs of Panama. I think it is fair to say that we all can agree that the COVID-19 crisis made inclusive digital transformation a top priority to mitigate negative effects and accelerate inclusive economic recovery. The need to embrace a win-win digital transformation is one of the main lessons learned from this crisis. In Panama, we consider the digital transformation of the government a matter of transparency, governance, and democracy. That's why the first call to order when the pandemic hit was digitalizing healthcare, communications, banking, social assistance, education, security, all of the projects of national government's action plans necessary to protect the population during the severe confinement measures. Panama's digital agenda was a program comprising different solutions to implement during the five-year term of our government, bringing the state apparatus closer to the digital citizen, a concept which we've developed equal access for all to efficient services, taking away bureaucracy of the state. This document 
was presented in December 2019 as part of a five-year work and was implemented in the first months of the 2020, a point when the pandemic had already declared in our country. Most of the 84 activities that were detailed in the program were developed during the pandemic. Our government has developed technological responses to meet the social needs of the country. Panama Solidario began a year ago. Thanks to this ambitious social aid plan, more than 6.6 .6 million bags of food have been delivered. 3 million solidarity vouchers and 8.2 million digital vouchers have been benefited more than 1.3 million people during the pandemic. The plan Panama Solidario was recognized by the Latin American Electronic Government Network. On the other hand, Panama's vaccination process began also through a virtual form, which were all Panamanians were asked to fill out in the platform. To date, more than 1 million people have connected and completed the form, an action that allows them to enter a database to manage the planning according to the dose of application, including our four phases contemplated by the health authorities. Additionally, the national government has an agreement with IATA for the development and use of the immunity passport on our international vaccination card. To date, more than 518,000 people have been vaccinated throughout the country. Congratulations to the President of the General Assembly for gathering us all, and thank you for the opportunity to address you today reiterating Panama's commitment and partnership to work with the international community and within this important fora proactively, shaping ways to achieve digital cooperation and connectivity. I thank the Minister for Foreign Affairs of Panama for the statement just made. I now invite members to view the pre-recorded statement of His Excellency Fleming Mola Mortensen, Minister for Development Cooperation and Minister for Nordic Cooperation of Denmark. Mr. President, Excellences, ladies and gentlemen, digital cooperation promises to shape all the UN core agendas, human rights, development, and peace and security. During the pandemic, digital transformation accelerated. The challenges and opportunities are rightly at the forefront of our agenda. The internet allows us to uphold important function in society during the pandemic, and it's an enabler of human rights. It can enhance government transparency and accountability and community organizations and political activism. At the same time, digitalization has deepened inequality. Women, persons with disabilities and the poor are more disconnected. And if they are online, they are more vulnerable to harassment, abuse and fraud. Civic space is under pressure. Anti-democratic regimes use online platforms to target and mute political opposition, civil society and human rights defenders. In 2020, we saw more than 150 targeted internet shutdowns and the pandemic has given room for further crackdowns on human rights online. Denmark is committed to fight attempts to limit dem democracy and human rights online. We will work with all relevant stakeholders to ensure that technology strengthens democracy and human rights. Denmark is one of the world's most digital democracies, and we have a whole new strategy for technology diplomacy. The strategy will strengthen our engagement with government, business and civil society. We want to ensure that the development and the use of technology is based on human rights in the way that strengthens good governance. We must build on the debate here today to identify and implement initiatives to bridge the digital divide and promote human rights and democratic values online. Thank you very much. I thank the Minister for Development, for Development Cooperation and Minister for Nordic Cooperation of Denmark for the statement just made. I now invite members to view the pre-recorded statement of Her Excellency Joyce Murray, Minister of Digital Government of Canada. 
Thank you. I'm honored to be with ministers and other leaders so enthusiastic about using digital to do good. First, let me acknowledge I'm joining you from my home in Vancouver, Canada, on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. En tant que ministre... As the Minister of Digital Government in Canada, I direct the efforts to ensure the digital transformation of our federal government. The aim here is to transform the experience of citizens with the government and to offer more reliable and secure services. As a result, our government was able to quickly help millions of Canadians and businesses with new supports like the Canada Emergency Response Benefit, the Canadian Emergency Wage Subsidy, and much, much more. We were also able to build tools to help Canadians stay informed about COVID-19 and the government supports that were available. Nous avons créé... We've created a service for notifications. It has a simple name, Get Updates on COVID-19. We've also launched an app for exposure notifications. It's called COVID Alert. It is based on the exposure notification platforms developed by Google and Apple. Now, our work is about accelerating this type of progress. While collaborating with all levels of government, the private sector, and our international partners to offer all Canadian citizens the digital services that they expect in the 21st century. We're confident these efforts will have a big payoff down the road because this is about more than just building better government services, as important as that is. It's about the wider benefits of becoming more digital, like working with governments around the world to implement measurable, sustainable IT procurement practices, practices that hold suppliers accountable for their carbon footprint and actively promote environmental stewardship. It's about supporting our greening government strategy, which includes a much greater focus on IT investments and which seeks to reduce emissions from government operations by 40% by 2030 and 100% by 2050. Such an occasion. This is an opportunity for empowerment and inclusion for Indigenous communities, for the marginalized, and for persons living with disabilities. While basic connectivity is the starting point, we need to build inclusion into everything we do to disperse the benefits from digital transformations in a way that respects human rights and leaves no one behind. And we look forward to working with you to do that. Thank you. I thank the Minister of Digital Government of Canada for the statement just made. I now invite members to view the pre-recorded statement of His Excellency Vittorio Colau, Minister, Minister for Technology Innovation, Minister for Technological Innovation and Digital Transition of Italy. Ladies and gentlemen, the digital transformation is moving at an unprecedented speed globally. In 2019, 64% of European citizens used an online public service at least once. Yet, the growth and geographical distribution of digital transformation have been uneven. In 2018, only 20% of enterprises in the OECD countries benefited from high-speed broadband. And among citizens, divides persist in terms of sophistication of internet use, in terms of generational use, and of course, also geographically. Indeed, the COVID-19 crisis has heightened concerns that digital transformation may contribute to widen performance and income gaps. Women, young people, low-skilled and non-standard workers experience starker income losses. According to UN CAD, in 2020, only one in five people used the internet in less developed countries. Low broadband quality hampered the ability for many to use teleconferencing tools and cramped possibilities to students to access online learning. According to UNESCO, even in developed countries, 10% of pupils experience issues with accessing digital education. We believe that the COVID-19 crisis may, and I would say should, turn into an opportunity for us to herald the broad-based acceleration of the digital transformation and foster an inclusive digital society. This is a challenge of both local and, lo and global dimensions. 
Country-specific challenges may vary. Italy, Italy's strategies aims at closing existing digital gaps through investment in broadband connectivity, leveraging digital government services, and strengthening citizens' digital skills. Digital transformation, to be impactful, needs to be fed by transnational synergies. The EU Digital Compass steers EU governments towards common policies and common goals. Accordingly, the Italian presidency of the G20 is focusing on governmental cooperation on social inclusion while driving economic growth through digital technologies. The international community could also benefit from multi-stakeholder partnership on digital identity, the possibility to provide citizens with digitized legal identities, ensuring seamless access to public and private services in respect of individual rights. For developing countries, digital identity is the opportunity to leapfrog outdated tools and build on mobile technologies to provide identifications for all. For advanced economy, to drive further the discussion of public, private and cross-border interoperability. And for citizens, to ensure that they are fully engaged in democratic societies and protected in their rights. We are confident that by engaging in dialogues designed after a human-centric approach to digitization, we could achieve an inclusive and thriving global digital society. Thank you very much for your attention and have a very productive debate. I thank the Minister for Technological Innovation and Digital Transition of Italy for the statement just made. I now invite members to view the pre-recorded statement of Her Excellency Mayra Aravich Mar Marin, Minister of Communications of Cuba. Senor President. Mr. President, distinguished delegates, information and communication technologies are an essential tool for economic, political, and social development of all countries. In spite of progress in connectivity, innovation, and access to these technologies, there is still a considerable digital divide between developed and developing countries. These gaps have widened even further in the context of the pandemic. The COVID-19 scenario has given greater significance to ICTs for working, studying, trade, and live in current circumstances. This situation reaffirmed the need to have telecommunications infrastructure favoring access for all on an equal footing, contributing to meet the great challenges faced by nations in the digital sphere. Cuba is working with an, on an economic and social development plan in line with the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development's goals and targets, including within the strategic axes and sectors of economy, the development of te telecommunications. And in this regard, there is a broadband program with indicators and objectives to be achieved by stages. Cuba, in spite of the economic, commercial, and financial embargo of the United States government, has been working in the context of the pandemic to expand telecommunication services. Currently, more than 64% of Cubans have access to internet, and mobile telephony has 6.6 .6 million users. 4G networks are growing, and 76% of the population has coverage for digital television signals. Excellencies, Cuba urges all for solidarity, calling for a cessation of unilateral coercive measures violating international law, the United Nations Charter, limiting the capability of states for universal and secure access to ICT as tools for an effective approach in the pandemic and to achieve the sustainable development goals in the 2030 Agenda. On the basis of these principles, we reaffirm the need to strengthen international cooperation and solidarity in order to build a just, equitable, inclusive world which is better connected. Thank you very much. I thank the Minister of Communications of Cuba for the statement just made. 
I now invite members to view the pre-recorded statement of His Excellency Per Olsen Fried, Minister of International Development Cooperation of Sweden. Excellencies, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, the pandemic has, whether we like it or not, forced us to take a leapfrog into the digital world. But it has at the same time taught us important lessons about the possibilities it possesses. The focus is to get out of the pandemic, recover and rebuild, and to transition into a more sustainable world. And I see three points on how digitalization can help us get there. The first is connectivity. This pandemic has revealed the deep digital divides that exists in this world. The fact that 3.7 billion people still have no access to the internet is not good enough. But the digital divide is also within countries where too often women do not have access to the internet to the same extent as men. We must ensure inclusion for all and we should raise the bar and do it well before 2030. Sweden is ready to do its share. The second is to embrace technology and utilize its potential. Whether we talk about economic development, climate change, fighting corruption, or strengthening human rights, digital technologies can help us advance our agendas in a more effective way than before. Therefore, we need to encourage innovative thinking. I have made it a priority for Sweden to step up our efforts in this regard. Just to give you one example, we're joining forces with global actors to make sure that the COVID vaccine can be traced and verified thereby reducing the risks of falsified medicines and corruption. While having a positive view on what the technology can do, we must also be vigilant that technology can be misused to strengthen authoritarian regimes, suppress human rights, not least freedom of expression, and to spread disinformation. And this leads me to the third point. We want an internet that is open, free and secure, in today's world, this is far from guaranteed. We need to protect human rights, uphold the rule of law, and promote Internet's positive role for democratic development. My government has made this a priority in our drive for democracy. I want to echo and fully support the UN Secretary General for promoting digital cooperation and making it a priority for 2021. We need more of this. And for it to be successful, the internet must be inclusive, transparent, and build on multi-stakeholder models, such as the Internet Governance Forum. Our offer to host UNICEF's new Office of Innovation is an example on how Sweden wishes to deepen our political and financial engagement with the UN. It is time to bring the many strands of work together and to take cooperation to a next level. The UN is clearly the platform where such a coherent and coordinated approach can take shape, but it will require efforts from all of us. And I can assure you that Sweden will continue to step up its support and commitment to the UN, to the UN roadmap to make technology a force for the good. Thank you. I thank the Minister for International Development Cooperation of Sweden for the statement just made. I now invite members to view the pre-recorded statement of His Excellency Peter, G Peter G Chato, Minister for Foreign Affairs and Trade of Hungary. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, first of all, for the opportunity to address you shortly on this thematic debate. The uh, coronavirus pandemic has changed everything in the world, but not only regarding global politics or global economy, but regarding everyday life uh, as well. We all have been pushed to the digital space uh, more than ever. People have to work from home and kids have to take part in school activities from home as well. Home office and the digital education uh, makes us using digital space much more than ever before. Luckily enough, Hungarian government has uh, started its digital development program not uh, only a year ago uh, when the pandemic has started, but already more than six years ago 
back in 2015. In two steps, we have decreased the VAT on, uh, on internet to 5%, which uh, puts us number one in Europe when it comes to um, the lowest VAT uh, of the uh, European continent on the internet use. When uh, we have um, introduced uh, emergency situation in Hungary, which uh, has uh, been concluded in uh, home office and um, digital education, uh, we have made a regulation uh, through uh, which using internet became free of charge both for students and for their teachers. In the meantime, we have put a lot of emphasis on developing the digital skills of all those uh, who are looking for jobs because of losing job um, uh, as a consequence of the uh, pandemic. Uh, tens of thousands of Hungarians were helped uh, in this regard to upgrade their own digital skills, which helped them uh, to uh, find new job on the labor market. We have put special emphasis on the uh, elderly, we have helped 80,000 uh, older citizens of uh, Hungary to develop uh, their digital uh, skills and to be mentorated uh, by uh, experts. I think it is crucial that uh, those countries which uh, have um, uh, collected uh, experience on how to help its own citizens to um, develop digital skills should help all those uh, who are not as developed as they are in this regard. We are ready for that, we offer our help, we offer our best practices to be shared and we are ready to contribute to the efforts of the United Nations to develop the digital skills of everybody living in every country of the world. I thank the Minister for Foreign Affairs and Trade of Hungary for the statement just made. We have heard the last speaker for this meeting. Before concluding, I would like to remind members that we will begin promptly at 3 p.m. in this hall with two more panel discussions, followed by the continuation of the list of speakers for the plenary segment at 5 p.m. Before adjourning this meeting, I would like to, uh, before adjourning this meeting, I would like to call the attention of members to the letter circulated on the 1st of April 2021, which has information regarding the Occupational Safety and Health Plan for this meeting, including in the possibility of follow-up in the unfortunate and hopefully unlikely event of a case of COVID-19. Following the arrangements in recent meetings, the Secretariat will actively manage the exit by calling each row for departure in a staggered manner. Members are therefore requested to remain seated after the adjournment of the meeting. The meeting is adjourned. I would now kindly request the delegates to leave the GA Hall according to the following staggered plan. First, I call on the delegates seated in the first row from Iceland to Italy to please leave.